So let's see. Got no drop frames. Here comes Anna. Here comes Anna. Let me get my thing up. All right. Look at this. Don't, hey. don't even, don't know. <laughs> I don't but, know. Don't, but uh, you haven't sacrificed enough to the the uh, fantasy cyber dogs. I, I, I guess. I guess. So yeah. we're not even going to do it. Yeah. So there Are we, we go. Live please now? pass. Yeah, we're live. We're live. Pass the word, please. Um, I, I just Eric, did in 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 Cannon Fire the Discord forum. All right, so, uh, Eric, um, Eric Boyd is gonna. I'm gonna have to try and Facebook message Eric Boyd here. Let's see if I can do that. Just because he's he looks like yeah. he's yellow. And see, look at this. This is all the fun things we get to do here. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Give me one second and, here. And I think Eric Menchie said he was going Yeah, Eric said he's coming back it. on. So once he yeah. gets his... Uh, um, Good. Yep. Uh, let's see here. I don't know what they fixed, but they did something here. Uh, um, so let me just type into Eric Boyd um, here. Because I know he looks at it. It is fixed. It is fixed. All right. So, wow. That's... <laughs> uh, there. And, and just, Thanks, Amy. Just, as, just as an example of um, how things surveil us, my computer just said Microsoft Edge has detected you've been having connection issues. Really? You oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I thought Microsoft Edge, <laughs> which I never use or turn it's, on. It's, so. it's 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 on there checking things constantly. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Get, lurking. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. finally live, everyone. So there you go. Um, give us, a, give me a second to get up here. Yes, uh, and we, you know, we'll probably have very low numbers tonight, but who gives a shit, right? So there you go. Who cares? Um, yeah. uh, that doesn't log matter. into that things here at, this, at this point. Yeah. So thanks, Mike. Uh, I can't tell you what happened, but um, they fixed it. So um, something was maybe uh, maybe it was on their end. I don't know. It's it's working now. Thank you, Amy, for that. Um, you know, just trying to pass the word. Uh, well, I don't know. We'll go for an hour or something. We'll just talk. You know, we'll talk a little sure. bit, maybe. Yeah. As long as Ed wants sure. to stay on and all, we'll go for about an hour. Uh, yeah. Sure. And uh, see if we can get Eric and Eric on. I'm keeping my Discord um, active here. Uh, he's going back to his computer. Um, I, I, I sent a message to Eric Boyd. But I don't know if he's going to see it. So, um, you know, but uh, just we can always catch back up. I know Eric had something he wanted to discuss. So, uh, Ed, thanks for being patient, everyone. I mean, it took an hour and no 40. It's almost two hours, Anna, because we came on at, uh, uh, what was it, 6, 6.35, and we had all these yeah, issues. Something it's been like two that. full yeah. hours of me being down. So, uh, <laughs> don't even say that, Gitana. Where's the sound? Oh, my gosh. So, um, I got some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, okay. I put away my I put away my shield and everything. I uh, got out some books, got out some Greyhawk books, got out for this one, got out all these great F Forgotten Realms books, got out a lot of stuff, you know. So, um, yeah. Uh, oh good yes. Lord. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. That is good. So uh, let's see. Okay, now you can resume your comedy routine. Yeah, I, I don't, uh, you know, uh, hey, it is what it is at this time. Uh, we'll, we'll make the best of it. Uh, you know, I know, I know a lot of people, uh, maybe they'll get the confirmations that we went live. Uh, hopefully that'll work. So um, here comes here comes Eric. That's good. So all we're missing is Eric Boyd. Hey, Nansen, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I had a, a, the mysteries of, the mysteries of freaking technology. They, mm -hmm. I guess there was something on their end or whatever, and now I get uploads. So, yep. you know. How are you doing, Eric? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, look at that. It's crystal clear now, too. Everything, yeah, you know, so. perfect. Yeah, yep. yeah. Oh. Eric has arrived, too. Wandering. Hey, Wandering, thank you so very much for the Tier 2 sub. I saw that. And I, it skipped by me. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so very much for that. So, um, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Good. Everyone's fine now that you're no longer suffering. Oh, my yes, God. Well, we were exactly. all, the community suffered. That's the way I look yeah. at it this way. Oh. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I got my door open. I, I got a nice yep. cool air coming in here. My sweating's done. So yep. why don't we start off by, I got a question. Um, I know that Gary Gygax and, and like Dave and the crew, they started with Thor and Odin, right? They were the first two deities ever used. And what were, what were like, what did you start out with? Like for Forgotten Realms, how did you start with the deity thought? Well, at first, there were two. There were two strands, and the one strand was it has to be official D and D. 
So everything that was being mentioned at, at conventions, like at early Gen Cons or in Dragon, like, you know, Surtur this and, and the, the Frost Giants that, I would slide into the realms. And the other thing was, I started the realms as a really young kid with an image that grew into stories. And the image was the two silver haired ladies. Oh. You know, one of them harping in the in the, the 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 snow falling gently in the clearing in the woods. And there's a lady with silver hair, silver like the metal, not like old people. Um, is sitting at a, around a, a tiny fire that she's made, harping. And you could see all the critter eyes in the trees of everything watching her. And her music brings another silver head lady to join out of the trees to join her. And that silver haired lady it cloaks. But the one who's coming towards her is wearing a full plate armor. And I needed to know who these two ladies were. You know, it was Storm and it was Dove as it happened, but I didn't know that yet. But then what would they, what did they do? And they were serving a goddess. So that's where Mistra came from. Okay. Okay. And that was the first real deity. That and and like I said, the little stuff that Gary and Len and and uh Jim Ward and everybody who were writing early dragon things, the little tidbits that they were putting in around the edges. So that's how it, the realms grew, grew the, the deities. So welcome, Eric. Welcome, Eric. Hello. <laughs> We've won terribly too many years. Oh my gosh, <laughs> man. What a freaking nightmare. But at least I, yeah. at least I persevered and, and we, got, we got back up. So yeah, Jay, you didn't sacrifice enough to, to the gods. Yeah, I, for this, I so. guess <laughs> I, I didn't do something yeah. uh, there. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to get up my stream labs and all, cause we're still, I'm still doing these giveaways tonight here. Thank you. Fantasy grounds Academy for keeping that going. So I'm trying to get in touch with Chuck cause uh, you know, uh, we're going to do um, at, uh, at least the digitals. I think we're going to do the giveaway also for um uh the my god my brain's off give me a second here as i keep on uh as I keep, thank you patrick you got, everyone's very kind and very uh, understanding i really appreciate that this is a great uh, the gods and legends uh publication from cat uh, from uh, troller games castles and crusades one hardback two digital copies okay that's what we'll do tonight on that we'll give a hardback out uh of that of this and uh, and uh chuck hasn't gotten back to me chuck didn't know who that was in the cover if it was if it was odin or not yet <laughs> either uh there ed so i'm trying to find out on the well, you cover see odin odin's supposed to hang on the tree with a spear through him well it's got to be him then in the mythology and he's traditionally depicted upside down hanging from the tree with the spear piercing his breast and his blood runs out okay yeah, and, and but maybe maybe this is the before version. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, Stephen Chanel will when tell he's us right side up when he's right side up. <laughs> yeah, when he's right side up. Yeah. So uh, you know, as we're talking, so Eric and Eric, Eric Mengi first. Eric, thank you for coming on back and being being uh, very uh, patient as well. Um, so uh, Eric, first uh, first god you ever like dealt with in your game? Like, would you, was it like a you know, hey, wow, you know. Grail up deities or, you know, experiences as far as early on with, with, uh, and the same thing for er Eric, who, by the way, everyone. Eric. He had come up with a different, uh, Eric M and Eric B, maybe. Yeah, Eric M. I'll just say M and B. How's that sound? Eric M. That works for me. Eric M. Perfect. Eric M. First experiences, man. Was it Greyhawk? Um, it was actually my home game, okay. which I was very influenced by Dragonlance at the time, just like every young dungeon master in the 1980s. And so my first two gods were um, basically reflections of Paladine and Meshackle. And they were, uh, okay. I'm trying to remember, Mielave and... Oland, I had renamed them for my world so that uh, the players would know who they were because every one of us had all read the Dragonlance books. So it was impossible to run the campaign for everybody because they all knew everything. <laughs> so I was just trying to uh, uh, obscure things a little bit, but uh, then I met the Greyhawk deities and they were much more robust than everything I, I was doing. Okay. Oh, Eric, and, uh, Eric slipped out. I'm sure he'll be back, and in greater numbers, too. Ah. Like all Eric's. <laughs> and uh, I actually picked up that uh, Deities and Demigod books uh, 
back in the day and I was trying to figure out how to use as many of those in the different worlds because I like the idea that okay. different gods have like zones in the world. And yeah. so as you travel from one zone to another, the their power of one uh, pantheon would fade. And you had to pick a new god when you went to a new area. That's oh, cool. That, that's a cool concept. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the players seem to like that one, which is like and why the uh, pantheons were fighting because they were trying to expand <laughs> their area of influence against each other. And that mm -hmm. led to a lot of religious wars, which led to conflict, which leads to drama, which leads mm -hmm. to adventure. So uh, that's interesting because, Eric, I went through some of the same things because this is before the uh, um, Gary Gygax, Greyhawk, uh, you know, it was Dragon 67, the first one comes out, right? With the deities really in it in the 83 box set. So um, we had the same thing. We had like one deity for each. We had, we had Corell and we had Grooms. We had all that. And then we have all these pantheons. Like, what the hell do I do with all these? I mean, you know, so we picked like Finnish. Some Norse, Finnish, and Celtic was kind of where we kind of put around, and and that's still in my game. I still have Uko, and the funny thing is, I still got I I still have Ilmater, uh and a couple others that I know are Forgotten Realms deities now, and, I, and I'm going to ask that question shortly too. Uh, um, yeah, but that's way that's where it was before you know before the Greek deities were really uh, really out there. So Eric Boy, yep, welcome, and everyone, Eric. As you can see, Demi Mediti's Powers of Pantheons, uh, look at the name on that, on that, whoops, I'm covering it, but it's by, Eric, they're both by Eric Boyd. And I know you have a ton in this one as well. Yep, yeah, that was, that I would like to point out I wear glasses because of those books. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably, I don't change my mind a lot, but one thing I've changed my mind on is when I was a lot younger, I was like, you can always make the font size smaller. Why would you yes. waste space <laughs> on big words? And now I'm like, who the heck agreed to this? <laughs> <laughs> On to, the like... other hand, all you have to do is open a COVID test and discover the instructions. <laughs> are, yep. You need a, not just a magnifying glass, <laughs> you, you need microscope. a microscope. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I want to experience that. Just to read it. Yeah, getting home from Gary Con when I got my con crud, I, I experienced that too. I had to find oh, more you and me both. glasses and turn on the light to see it. I'm <laughs> by the way, I'm posting all discords. We finally got live, so just bear with me here. So the yep. so um Eric, how'd you get how'd you get the um how'd you get this gig, this sweet gig? Um oops. With all the with all the deities, with the deity books. Was that your um, shtick? Well, so it was kind of interesting. When I was when I was younger, when I was younger, oh, hang on a sec, I'm getting feedback. Oh, uh oh. Can you hear me now? I hear a dog yeah. barking. Mm -hmm. I hear yeah. a okay. dog yelping. Yeah. yeah, she's gonna do that too. That's okay, right, no that's problem. <laughs> um, yeah. So honestly, in the early '80s, when I was a kid and was playing, um, I never played clerics. I thought they were boring. Uh, and um, then in the late 80s, I didn't have a campaign, but I did do a ton of reading. Um, so I remember Ed's article in Dragon 54. You know, I remember reading through Demi-Human Deities, or uh, sorry, Deities and Demigods and loving that. And then um, I started up a campaign again, like the beginning of 1990. And um, I remember we had like a, a Ranger Cleric of Shondical and like a Paladin of Torm. And it was in the haunted halls of Evening Star, so there was a lot to do with Lathander. I think we had a priest of Lathander as well. And, you know, I really got into those three deities because my players were playing them. And, in fact, I think those are my three favorite write-ups in Face and Avatar. Oh, okay. <laughs> basically stolen out of my campaign. Yeah. But at the same time, I was still doing all the reading, and Ed kept, like, dropping, like, breadcrumbs, these little... De one word deity references all <laughs> over the place everywhere you looked and like there'd literally be like no other references there'd be si a single sentence and that was it to hang it on so i convinced the editors of polyhedron to um let me uh write a forgotten deities column and i started trying to like detail some of the yeah. more obscure ones and then um ed and julia were working on face and avatars and and I kept emailing her suggestions, and then I offered to read stuff, and then I was like, by the way, I wrote this stuff you could just use, and I kind of weaseled my way into that. And um, but I had a great time working with Ed, working with Julia on it. They did a fantastic job, 
and they put up with me and then they let me write some more. So that's kind of how it happened. That is awesome. So here's my number. Anna, if you got a question for the three, um, please let me know. But here's my number one question. Mm -hmm. How do how do you decide like certain deities make it into this book? Like, because you got a lot of finished deities in here. Myliki, right, makes it. Ilmater makes it. And as far as Grail goes, it's just Saint Cuthbert is one of the ones that are named that I know of, and all the rest seem to be made up. What? How did the some of the finished ones make it in here, and not others that are made from scratch? Which I'm assuming you had most of them are you know you and Eric and in the combination have made a lot of these from scratch. Does that make sense on that question? Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of these are from deities and demi a couple a lot of the finished deities and demigods. You should uh, ask you should ask Ed because he's the one who wrote the Dragon Fifty Four article. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and well, the Dragon Fifty Four article lays out why I made the the design decisions I did. Okay. And again, a lot of them were um, I'm trying to make this official. So if Gary's done something or somebody else, so it's 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 okay. a it's an official product that's in print and they've done something that, that uh, gives me a deity sort of like what I need, like a giant deity or an elemental deity. I'll use it unless I think there's something missing or wrong. And I'm trying to balance alignments and I'm trying to, and I'm introducing formally for the first time, they've always had them. I didn't come up with this but I added it to the D&D &D game, formal portfolios for the deities. And then, as we were talking about earlier, how they fight for um, worshipers, they fight for influence, there's always going to be deities fighting over portfolios. Well, that's mine. That's really mine. Well, actually, I have, you know, a demigod who serves me. Later on, they call them exarchs and stuff like that. But, you know, um, I have a demigod who serves me, who's actually the god of keys that go in locks. So, therefore, uh, mm -hmm. we should be stronger than you. So, meh. Uh, and, and, of course, if, if you tie it to the mortal worshippers have free will, which you need to have in the game. Otherwise, your player character is a pawn and the gods control it, not you, which is and the antithesis of what you want in the game, then mortals have to have free will, so they have to have control, so they have to have influence, so the deities have to in some way be beholden to them. So what I was literally doing, and, and it, I laid it out in that Dragon 54 article, I, I grabbed this from de deities and demigods, I changed this because I didn't like that. I don't, want, I don't like weapons that never miss and gods that can read your mind, and gods that never make a mistake. No, they all have to be fallible. They have to be like the Greek and Roman gods, superhumans, but with all human faults as well. Um, you know, you, if I pick up Odin, oh, I see, this weapon never misses. No, thank you. I'm not using it. I don't want okay. that sort of, you know, I want things to be, There's always. There, I want there always to be a chance. And then I want the deities to change over time, just as humans grow, develop, and change over time, so that they will change their opinions, so that they will have fights with each other, so that they will change their minds by what mortals do in your campaign. And then from that, everything else flow. Yeah. I So, or like, you know, chronologically, what I would add is, you know, deities and demigods came out first the full deities and demigods without the two missing pantheons, right? Yeah. And yep. then Ed wrote the Dragon 54 article, and you can see that he's borrowing from all the pantheons, including the two that are going to get excluded in the later publications. And yes. then And then you have the old gray box come out, and that pretty much matches what Ed wrote, except they dropped everything from those two pantheons that were pulled out of the later printings of deities and demigods. So you don't see some of the beast cult ones that were like from the uh, Melbonian or Nuhan mythos or stuff like that. And then, um, so oh. then you had the, go ahead, Dan, and then I'll finish. I was just, just going to say just one more little change they made. They, after the gray box came out, they took Tyche out because they said, oh, that's a real deity. People could be offended. Yeah. And, and so we got Timor and Bishaba. Now I'll shut up again. Go no, 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 yeah. that's, that's, so, 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 but just, just let me finish. Sorry, yeah, real quick. So, so then, then we went to 
So then you then you had a couple ones that I think were Jeff Grubb editions, right? Ones like uh, Joaquin. Joaquin. And then the second edition box that came out, and I'm guessing Red Knight might have been his again. I'm not sure. Oh, that was. that's the one I want to ask. It's one of someone my favorites. At, someone at TSR, yes, yep. definitely. Okay. And then that's that's when Face and Avatars comes out. So Face and Avatars kind of matches the core pantheon that got published in the first edition and second edition of Box with uh, maybe a couple editions like Sean DeCall, but that was about it. And then Powers and Pantheons was like the cleanup, right? It was all the obscure ones that I could find. Plus, in the meantime, the Mulheron Pantheon had changed significantly because of FR10. And um, you had the Chulton Pantheon because of like Ring of the novel Ring of Winter. And so it was mm -hmm. an attempt to bring all that together. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's Jeff. good. No, no, it's great. No, I was just, I'm waving to everyone who's coming on late. So I'm just like keeping on waving, waving, waving. waving. So, um, that's pretty cool to hear that. So you had multiple people bringing in deities, and then and are you approving them? Who's approving them? Because oh, that, that that's being done in house. It's doing uh, in house. Know, okay, okay. They, they own the realms now, and they're doing things. But uh, Jeff Grubb is phoning me weekly, and we're having long chats. And some of the time when we're chatting, he's sounding me out on my opinion. Without letting me know, he's sounding me like <laughs> Oh, um, okay. And then there are other times when, uh, then when it'll be a formal ask, like, "Hey, Ed, we want to steal the name of your newspaper, Neverwinter Nights, because a gaming, uh, a computer gaming <laughs> company wants to use it. Is that okay with you? Sure. You know. <laughs> okay. Wow. That's a, that's. Mm -hmm. So at this time. You got Greyhawk deities. You got your base Greyhawk deities. You have your Len Sulis deities, right? Uh, you don't really have is the Baclunish and the Iridian deities done up that much at this point. I don't think they are. So you have mostly Sulis and standard Greyhawk deities, and you have your Forgotten Realm deities, right? And then later on, we're going to see some of the Iridians and the Baclunish deities added. Am I correct on that? I think, Eric. Uh, yeah. I I think yeah. Yeah, Eric is you're muted, Eric. So. How about you, Eric? Do you, uh, do you... Sorry, 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 my dog is barking in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the so middle of fun. like texting my son to come get the dog. But that's okay. yes, I think that's I think okay. that's basically correct. Okay. So in, in Greyhawk, you had like your five pantheons, and they were pretty separated. Um they're modern pantheons, I would stress. Um, they're not necessarily the ancient pantheon. So like I always look at the Soul Pantheon and think, why um, the, the Sewell Pantheon, as you see it, like with lens articles and in the box set, is a it's fairly seafaring focused, yeah. And that didn't necessarily make sense to what you would have had as your Pantheon prior to the uh, you know, the Reign of Colorless Fire and Invoke Devastation. And so, um, you know, th those Pantheons must have evolved. I always wanted to kind of try to figure out what the original Pantheon would be, but I do think you had your five basic Greyhawk Pantheons like that, and then in the realms you had, it was a little bit different because you had your major Faerunian Pantheon, and then you had some minor Pantheons, the Chultan and the Mulhorandi. We have Ed's, we have uh, um, Len's original chart, by the way, for, for Sui, so yeah. Eric, we have the original Ooh, chart. Oh, I would love to see that. Somewhere. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it's a photocopy, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it has it has Aquaman on there. That was the <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the one that we couldn't figure out. And uh, I mean, the lead. What are you doing, uh, lead? But you know, he had yeah. Bahamut and Tiamat in as major deities in the Sulwe's realm, and uh, you know, and it showed who was above who, you know, greater, lesser. I, I, we can share that, absolutely. You, ha you have to have Aquaman. You've always had the Trident of Fish command since first edition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Phoenix, good to see you, and thank you, everyone, for being so patient on. We already got 94. We got 94 people on! So, thank you. Um, you know, uh, it just, hey, we're going to be running late tonight because we started so late, and I had some bizarre... Uh, I had no upload. I had one gig download, zero upload, never seen it, and then uh, Comcast finally figured it out. So, uh, Eric, um, Eric M. So, you're playing early on, and then Living Grey all comes along, and then you have a blast of flan deities, right? Like yeah. Alatur, right? I mean, so yes. that comes along, yes. Yes. Oh, anyway. yeah. Yeah. So many. They gave us Jeff, which is way up in the mountains. Yep. 
Uh, for those who are not familiar with living with Greyhawk terrain, uh, if you go to <coughs> the far western reaches tucked up in the where two mountain ranges joined, that was the region that was assigned to us called the Grand Duchy of Jeff. And we decided to make it as old school with the, uh, the uh, original people that lived in Earth were called the Flanay. And we decided to go hardcore on the Flan Flanay. And uh, <clears throat> drew a lot of inspiration from Celtic uh, deities, but we were weaving that through the established deities in Greyhawk. And so it's kind of a great example of how you can take what's there and tailor it to your own specific needs and move it and kind of create our own mini pantheon as it was within Greyhawk. Where Which we have the old faith of Pelor, Obed High, Alona, Biori, and the last one was we threw in was Nerul, which always threw people. Mm -hmm. Kind of, so you you you've merged an old faith thought, like a, a pantheon, in with some of these uh, Flanay deities that uh, you guys created. Did you group create, or did uh, or did you look from other sources on those? Uh, well, we went through all the normal. Uh, the stuff from the Greyhawk Journal and all the things that Gary Gygax wrote and everything everyone wrote, and they were listed as Flan deities. Okay. And some of them had been moved into uh, general <coughs> usage, particularly by uh, Pelor, for example. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. but we wanted to do something a bit bigger than just Biori, yeah. who is the Earth, uh, the Earth Mother, as mm -hmm. it were, of, Grey, of Greyhawk. And there were all these other <coughs> gods out there like Obat High and Alona who were kind of in opposition to each other. And so we took those five deities and we created a wheel. And that was one of the central ten tenements we had of the old faith, which was since they were Druidic and our uh, founding member, I guess, is uh, Drew Ashtaff of Hamlet mm -hmm. as our old faith uh, standard bearer of what would Giroux do? <laughs> and we were thinking that he would uh, look at what St. Cuthbert was up to. And it's like, okay, you're the hot new thing for now. <laughs> but eventually the wheel is going to turn. The seasons will change and uh, things will move on. And so everything about the old faith was cyclical. So we have we, uh, affiliated each of the deities with a season. And then we put Pelor in the middle as the sun, a center of the sun, and around it was Obed High, uh, sorry, yeah, Alona, the spirit of spring, Obed High, the spirit of summer, Biori, the uh, the spirit of autumn, and then finally Nerul as the spirit of winter. And the, that is the cycle that will continue to go, always and forever. And that was the way the Druids look at everything. Of like, we don't get involved in current politics because the wheel is going to change, going to turn. We are not going to get involved in individual uh, cults of personality because the seasons will change. We're here to maintain the wheel and to make sure that the seasons continue to change. And this frustrated the players to no end as they're trying to drag the Druids in on things. And the druids only came in if they felt that the uh, the balance was being threatened and that the wheel would not continue to turn. Very, very I, interesting. I really, I really like that because I think it's really neat to come up with a a conception for a pantheon for a culture and then have it be significantly different, even if it's reusing some of the same gods for the next culture. So, mm -hmm. what's nice about what you were just laying out, Eric, is it's got a lot of integrity to it in the sense of it's a coherent consistent single culture view on some deities that may span across multiple cultures i've actually been trying to do that as well for some of the realms things so like i've been working out i think i talked about this maybe on an earlier show i don't remember you know working out a pantheon for the ruathans who were the predecessors of the aluskans in the realms who were like the i, I don't like to use real world analogs but kind of like the vikings who came over from the west across the sea and came up with a way to use like the existing gods, like the gods of Fury, Talos, Oral, Malar, and Umberly. And those are the bad guys, like the Elder Titans. I love some of those. And then there's no actual gods. There's just hero deities. So you have bad Elder Titans and good hero deities. And they like play 
um, and and they're sort of roles that are played by different gods. So there's like the hunter and the tracker and the stalker, and you and you assign them, you know, at different times in history. Like the hunter role was played by Guerin Rindstrom, or um, the the wanderer was played by Sean DeCall, or um, you know, you can kind of do stuff like that. So just like taking a pan, you know, building a little micro pantheon out of a subset of the deities and affiliating it with a culture, I think, is great fun. Very cool, Eric. I, and I, um, I know, um, you know, you guys all take your deities seriously. <laughs> I mean, that's a big thing. It, 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 um, and uh, I, with specialty priests and specialty druids and all the other things, and Anna's into the old faith. I know Eric, Eric and uh, Jose. I mean, have done a, a ton of old faith of old faith things as well. It, it really uh, it brings a, a huge amount of flavor to your campaigns, and that's that's part of bringing you know flushing your campaign to life is and ha is having you know these different factions. Uh, you know involved in your game it's really neat and one of the the things i the one of the reasons i put so many deities into the realms at the beginning was to keep it on a role-playing level as in you're you're in a dungeon and you see an idol carved out of the side wall okay what deity is it it's partially worn away it's really old you don't want you don't want six deities so everybody goes well looks female to me from the form so it's got to be this this or this and and she's sitting down so it's got to be this <laughs> not that you don't ever want metagaming thing to take over the player's thought at the table you want it to be that sense of awe and wonder and that wariness as you go what is this where what is this sacred ground we're treading on whose you know, and then you, and so if you have enough deities that nobody can hold everything in their head as a player at the gaming table, then it's back to the role playing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with de with deities, um, I know uh, there's a lot of Greyhawk ones that are wandering about the prime material, wandering about Earth, right, Anna? Far Lane, and you got St. Cuthbert, yeah, and, and Cuthbert. Yeah, there's some that are much more connected to, to the everyday life than others, so to speak. And it's even described here that the major gods, the greater gods, don't pay much attention. It's the the, the lesser deities that have the 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 day to day contact and closer closer connections to to the setting itself. So. So, so, and I kind of like that, that the, the really powerful ones, they have even bigger problems and, and bigger things to attend to than, than the me meager little problems of mere mortals who go around toiling and whatever they're doing. So, yeah. So, Patrick had a quick question, and then we're going to, I know you all have some special things you want to talk about, and I know, uh, you know, with the, time, with the time frame here. Uh, did any of you visit the actual Church of St. Cuthbert in Edinburgh, Scotland, ever? Anyone? Yes, yes Ed. Okay. Of course. Eric, too. Wow. Nice. Very cool. And that seems to be the one main deity that Gary uh, latched on that is from real history. Or a facsimile of, or similar? or Yeah, very similar. Okay. I think. All right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, right. I think I think it was the cudgel that did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Which probably also is why, I don't know if folks remember that uh, adventure that was in Dungeon Magazine. Where you actually went to London after the mace? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. Um, where you could go after the mace of Saint Cuthbert by actually traveling to London with your D and D characters. <laughs> it was a fun adventure. It was a long time ago. I don't remember what issue that was. That's the the, the first adventure we ever did when we played in Hamlet. Before I ever ran anything in Greyhawk, then I didn't understand it was Hamlet. Maybe you renamed it, but I understand afterwards that it was Hom was Hamlet because I recognized the map and and the places. And we went to the temple, and our main mission was to find that that Cudgel of of, of of Cuthbert because it was missing from the statue in, in the in the village. We had to run around and we didn't realize that the world was bigger than the village. We basically 
immediately ran around and tried to knock out the head of, of every villager that we could find to ask for this thing. And 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 we were we were 15, 16 years old, so we weren't that sophisticated. <laughs> so we almost turned into murder hobby trying to find the, the cut gloves and cuthbert. So yeah, that was one of my very first, I think it was like the third, fourth or fifth or maybe tenth. It was one of the first 10 adventures I've ever did, did in DD. Maybe one of the, the first or the second in AD D. So so <laughs> yeah. Two quick questions okay. from the audience. Mac asks, uh, ask Ed and the Erics if they think there would be a lot of other gods worshipped elsewhere on uh, other places of Toral and Earth that weren't that aren't discussed that much. And I, I would assume the answer is yes. Yes, play spirits for one thing. Okay. All sorts of places that are rural have play spirits, and and mm -hmm. even some that have been built on, like cities. Uh, the the deity or or demi deity uh, of this well might survive. Mm -hmm. But, but yes, uh, all sorts of play spirits, springs that come out of the earth where they rise, like the, the headwaters of the Unicorn Run um, in the high forest. Uh, there be local beliefs in that there are divine beings. And of course, they may be just fae. They may be something else, but they're worshipped locally. Mm -hmm. And it's they, they get the same sort of reverence and worship and seeking guidance um on the part of mortals so um nope. clerics striding around you know with uh, uh shining teeth and shining maces and smiting other people on their shining heads for the glory of the god um they they still serve serve the the religious the reverence part and the ability to be um to either lead mortals into actions or to be misconstrued so mortals use them as a justification for actions. Oh, the god told me to do this. That's why I I ate all the children in the village, because the god told me to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, I, I would be of the theory that any isolated culture probably has its own pantheon if it's been around for a while. Yeah. And when two cultures merge or cross, in you know give it enough time you're going to end up with one pantheon so you know the distinction between the flan and the and the iridian and the soul uh deities in um in greyhawk will go away given a few centuries as you kind of merge more and more into one population um and what that can lead to is also conflict so like in the realms you had three different storm gods that we know of you had talos you had koza and you had Belros. And though the followers of those three, as those cultures started to merge together, the Ruath and the Netherese and the Kalashite, the clashes of those three cultures, you have those gods essentially merging into one and battling each other. So I think you'd have the same thing. If it's an isolated culture on Earth, they'd have their own pantheon. But once they start, you know, trading with and merging with another culture, then you're going to kind of sort it out and not have... and the there'll be winners and losers. I, I totally agree. And I think one of the interesting examples in Greyhawk is uh, a couple of them. One is Pelor, I think is kind of interesting that that was originally a Flan god, but now seemed to have gotten more and more as, as the Iridian and Flan cultures kind of merged, especially in the Western part of Erdi, like Furiundi, Valuna, and, and, and those areas that, <clears throat> that weren't occupied as long and were not the heartlands of the Erdi, then Impaler seems to have kind of taken over a lot of the Falter's role and 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 become the sun god and and Rao is the, the god of the, the theocracy of the Luna and stuff. So so there seems to be, I think, a good example of of emerging Flan and Oridian kind of pantheons. And 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 in my campaign now when the Great Kingdom has fallen apart, that has become even more so, so to speak. And all of a sudden, there is like a cultural vacuum who's going to take over after. And 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 especially since the evil male exes have taken kind of taken part of the hostage, and that means that that part of the the the, the Iridian faith is not seen that well. So old Flan gods all of a sudden seems kind of fairly reasonable. And Paylor and Rao and Cuthbert and others who come more from the Flan side of things. <clears throat> are their their shares are going up, so to speak, significantly in my campaign. Eric, your 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 uh, Eric M, your Grichiov campaign was isolated, mm -hmm. and that's yeah, we were yeah. uh, we had a bunch of forests to seal us away from Kielan. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, your pantheon that you grew was an isolated pantheon in, in a matter of mm -hmm. fact, like that. So yeah. it, I think you could do that in either of the realm, in the realms or of Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and from a design standpoint, if you want to have a uh, create new gods to have to create a specific culture, that is definitely on the table. So, for example, if you have like uh, the PMs. Am I pronouncing that right, Jay? The, the, the uh, writers, the, the, the step writers in the northwest part of uh, Greyhawk. You could definitely have uh, gods that will be of importance to that particular culture would get a whole lot more worship there that might have no bearing anywhere else in the realms. Maybe a, like the horse god right. would be mm -hmm. of particular value to an entire society that is dependent upon its horse. And whether it was the great the great stallion that will mount the world, if you want to borrow a phrase from Martin, and uh, how they would revere that, and you can place that there. Or if you have another one that is very aquatic based, then they would have gods based upon the various, maybe the uh, god of uh, monsoons. Then, and I, 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 whenever you're making your gods up, look at the culture that you want to create, mm -hmm. and see if the uh, what would reflect in that. And how would that interact with the world? And uh, they are usually not so much in a uh, no god, no man is an island, and no neither is any god. Even the old faith was having to bump up against other people all around them whenever, like the knights of uh, oh heavens, knights of the watch showed up, and they squabbled with the old faith nonstop. Yeah. It's a very cool question. We'll take one more from the audience and then you guys are going to rotate in all this cool stuff I know all three of you have. So yeah. I, I, um, when's it time to stat and not to stat a deity? Skarshak asked. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what do you think? You got, who wants to take that one up? I don't think I you should ever stat a deity. Okay. Bingo! Exactly. <laughs> okay. never, they should yes. never be statted. Yes. I was and just, I say that as yeah. someone whose arm was twisted into writing innumerable useless deity yes. stat blocks. <laughs> yeah. um, yep. You should stat the heck out of the clerics and the, mm -hmm. the faith and the church and the temples, yep. Yep. all that. Don't ever stat the deity. Yep. And I'm by the way, by the way <laughs> some of that, some of that doing stat blocks was to make sure that we didn't do up, if you worship God X, here are your prayers. Here's what you can and can't do. Here's Here's what your church looks like. This is what is holy water. This is how you make it or whatever. Because there was great wariness in TSR land in, you know, um, Christian rural America of the time of let's not ruffle any feathers. Let's not step on anyone's toes. Let's avoid all that stuff. And of course, unfortunately, that's all the stuff that makes role playing a cleric truly different than role-playing a fighter who can't use edge weapons mm -hmm. and can heal. And of course, that's why we got a lot of first edition, the cleric selling his healing to everybody else in the party. <laughs> what do you give me for, oh for my gosh, your just, light wounds? We just had that discussion. Of, yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think the immortal set there, Ice Wind, is, uh, 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 if it's Mistara, is an exception. I think that's based on interacting with the gods and that and that. Right. Mm. Yeah. I but I mean, but I mean, I, I literally had stuff killed for Dragon where they said, you've put a prayer in. You've put a holy symbol in. Some kid's going to chalk that on a wall somewhere. Here. We're going to get a lawsuit, horrible publicity. Out it goes. Okay. So out it went. And to me, it was like such a pity because if you had that stuff published, and of course, later on with the internet, you could have snuck it out at Dragon's Foot or something like that mm -hmm. and had it out there for the fans to find and not have the company's um, name and brand right on it. But I mean, it would have been a way to role play deities. You'd know what prayers. So the dungeon master could actually have non-player characters saying the words of a prayer when the, the party members burst into the temple and say, why do you have that woman on that altar? You foul fiends, you. <laughs> and then the woman sits up and says, hey, don't screw up the spring fertility ritual or all our crops will fail. Yep. 
So, yeah. I don't know, Ed, didn't they get into hot water over the Forgotten Temple of Thrasden, which came perilously close to defying a whole bunch of diab uh, diabolistic... Uh, yes! I think that was what they were thinking of, the hate letters that started pouring in. And and would I ever have done that in the realms? No, because they'd already done it. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, that's like saying the guy next door just made a new pickup. I have to make an identical one. No, mm -hmm. I don't. I want to make something different. Right. Good point. <clears throat> so, I, don't know, I don't know if they would see the difference. <laughs> And, uh, you know, back in that era, I think when, when they're starting, to, they're feeling their way and Jim's putting together this book, um, didn't know any better. And everything started mm -hmm. up in the in Deity's Demigods. Not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Just is what it is. You know. Well, there was there was a great amount of stuff back in the Apazine days. Alarms and excursions. Remember all that? We killed Odin. We killed Asmodeus. We killed, you know. Um, and so there were there were parties of characters who wanted to go and kill the gods. And in some cases, it was for bragging rights. And in some cases, it was, and when we kill Odin, we get his, this cool magic item, these powers, you know. Um, I, I think that's a an arms race silly way of running a campaign because, boy, is it going to blow up awful fast. I would drop <coughs> it. But yeah. there were people who wanted to pursue it, and therefore... There's a design reason for, oh, we have to have stats for these. Yeah, yeah I, so I tried to tackle that in, in my campaign. So I put in, made, made rules for how gods are created and how they're killed. And, and, and so I, I put a link into them. I just opened them up. So everyone, they're on my website now. Yep, so, so you can, you can kind of, and, and the, so, the, and that's also a way to stat the gods, but not their personal stats, not how strong and dexterous and stuff, but how their influence, meaning what could they, they do beyond themselves? Because that's what's really interesting, the influence of, of the god and its church and stuff on culture and politics and, and the world. That I think is what's interesting to stat. Not how difficult it will be to fight the god individually, because you should never even get close to doing that, so to speak. One would hope, but yeah. you know we know how things oh. go. So um, and yeah. gods can't be killed. The powerful gods in my campaign can't be killed that way. They can only be forgotten. Which Ooh. means that if you, if you want to kill something that is really powerful, you have to kill every single follower of them. And then you have to kill yourself too, because you're also <laughs> aware of and hate the god in, in question. So you have to you have to actually eradicate your own order that goes after them as well. Otherwise the god will persist because of your hatred. Now there's a knowledge. career path, folks. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. To make it really difficult to get to those really pesky, powerful, really powerful gods. Hey, to be forgotten. Yeah. Jose, yeah, Jose Ortiz is on your partner in crime there, Eric. Uh, and it goes over the top all the time. Thank I was you. Like, yes. yeah. So yeah, that it was... Actually, yeah, it's one of my, on, on my Patreon blog, this yeah. is the most viewed and, and some of the awesome. most liked articles I've ever, more than any of my maps. So I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> this is just my first, I, I've already tweaked, there is a second in, in, in improved version out of it. I've changed the names, I'm going to change the names so they've, fit to the quasi hero whatever so it matches greyhawk names i haven't done that yet so that is coming plus a few of the other ones but it's it's kind of an idea of how you can run gods in your game that is different from the the, the standard ones so to speak and and so it's it's so cherry pick the parts you like and yeah. skip the ones you don't so to speak as always yeah so i know all three of you have some tidbits here who wants to go first yeah. Eric Boyd wants to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Eric's got Eric's got a, but Eric's got one that he's like, I bet you I got a, a deity that no one has everyone's forgotten about, right? Oh, you're you're muted. Okay. So yes, I think I found the deity that almost nobody knows about, um, or at least has forgotten about, uh, that can both be a realms deity and a Greyhawk deity. Ooh. Um and obscure enough that he barely even appears in Google, which I think is a, a sign of, of mm -hmm. how you truly have to get forgotten. There it is. Yep. Um, then you're right. dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to tell you the story of Merch and Armeg. M-E-R-R-G-S-H and A-R-M-M-E-G-H. 
And that story begins on the cover of Polyhedron 52, which uh, I did give Jay a bit of a hint. Uh, and yeah. you can see it right there. Yeah, yes. um, and the editors of that fine publication ran a contest to design a character corresponding to the cover. And the winners of the contest appeared in Polyhedron 58. So Tim Beach won first place for Tessera Katrina, a mutated wolf, and Fabulous Tyan, a humanoid boar from the Gamma World setting. And third place went to Jason Exum, who designed Andrus Bogos, a.k.a. Glutton, and Manslaughter, both mutant wolves from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> However, the entry that I think interests us today was the second place winner created by Wes Nicholson. I don't believe I've ever met Wes, but I do recognize his byline from many RPGA-related activities. He hosted um, me for five weeks in Australia. He was the RPGA regional Wow, director. very cool. Yes. And he wrote a Lankmar adventure, too. Nice. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see what... He didn't give us very much information in his second place entry, but what he did give us was interesting. So we have Merch and his wolf steed Armeg, and Merch was a lawful evil lesser god of the orc pantheon, most often found in the Nine Hells. And his symbol was a pair of squinting eyes. And weirdly, he's not exactly given a portfolio, but if you look at his abilities and what he's interested in, uh, he has the power to rally armies of orcs and direct them to do his bidding. In his true form, he appears as a shadowy figure with glowing red eyes. And when his avatar visits the prime material plane, he often appears as a fearsome warrior in black dragon scale armor and in the company of a great wolf. And in such form, he leads orc armies to victory in battles against goblins. Of note, his horn and belt are particularly effective against goblins. Um, and he gathers worshippers by observing orc tribes and sending his avatar to contact the strongest members. These he rallies, rallies to his side, and if they're not in charge of their tribes, he encourages them to usurp the present leader's positions. If the usurper is successful, the new leader orders the tribe to worship him. And if he's defeated, he just picks another strong orc, orc and tries again. And his wolf, Armeg, is the offspring of Tiamat and Grumsh, which not something I want to think about. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> but he and the wolf lost an eye in his first battle with a goblin army and he eternally seeks revenge. So I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. I wonder what we can do with this and how we fit it into the settings. So one thing to remember, of course, is that orcs were culturally lawful evil in first and second edition, and then abruptly shifted to chaotic evil in third edition. And this caused a lot of lore continuity problems in both Greyhawk and the realms. And second, Merch's focus on killing goblins is rather vague, although at least Armeg's hatred is given a motivation. And third, most orc deities are not affiliated with the Nine Hells. And finally, what is Grumsh, whose chaotic evil as a third edition? Think of Merch. We've got, you know, Grumsh has other uh, sort of lieutenants. There's Il Neville, who's lawful evil and tactically brilliant, but loyal. And Bagtrue, who's chaotic evil and incredibly strong, but dumb as a rock. So neither of them are really a, really a threat to the one-eyed god. Merch seems like a real threat, given his love of usurpers. So to my mind... He's the god of usurpers, right? Okay. Uh, and by the way, I'm monologuing here, so just jump in and interrupt me whenever. No, this is great. This is great. So, yep. first, yeah. conclu first conclusion Merch is on the periphery of the orc pantheon, serving as the god of usurpers. Second conclusion he's definitely a threat to Grumsh's position. And being enemies with Grumsh doesn't seem like a very secure long term position for a lesser orc god deity. Then second, we know that he's known for battling goblins rather than focusing on elves and dwarves, for example. This also seems like a distraction from overthrowing Grumsh. Why would you pick a fight with the minions of Maglubia? Is he trying to kill enough goblins to weaken the Mighty One and take his throne as well? This seems overly ambitious. So second conclusion, conclusion he's a threat to both Grumsh and Maglubia, but he's more focused on conquering the Orc Pantheon and dominating or killing the Goblin Pantheon than he is on the traditional threats to the race. And to my mind, this suggests he's working for a third party who's trying to bring the orcs and goblins to heal. So where do we go from there? We know he's noted for making regular pilgrimages to the Nine Hells. So my first thought was perhaps our little, own, little known orc deity is working for one of the arch devils. This would make some amount of sense because I could see the arch devils plotting against the orcs and goblin gods. But then another thought occurred to me and I kind of went with it. The Nine Hells are also home to all manner of outcast devils. We know this because Ed, 
who brought us his delightful series of articles about the Nine Hells, included a lot of outcast devils from Avernus in Dragon 75, 76, and 91. So here's my supposition. What if Mirksh was an outcast devil who was elevated to godhood by some third-party deity? And what if that third party seeks to use Mercs to weaken Grumsh and Maglybit through the activities of this usurper god? So finally, a few more tidbits. We know that Mercs is known to wear black dragon scale armor. This certainly suggests he killed a powerful and important black dragon on any home world he's active on. So let's file that one away for later. Okay. We can also file away the intriguing editorial choice. If you look at the cover that Jay's got up there, there's one head on that wolf. But if you look at the same picture in Polyhedron 58, for some reason, the editors put two two heads on the wolf. Double so it changed as they were doing the, the contest, which I thought was a little bit strange. Okay, so now we're now I'm actually ready to talk about Toral and O'Earth. I'm going to start with Faerun, because I know Jay is a big fan of Greyhawk, and I want to keep him on the edge of his seat so he doesn't rush, so he doesn't rush me off the stage. <laughs> yeah, you're good, man. This is awesome. All right, so who's Merck's mysterious patron in the realms? The obvious candidate is Bane, the Black Lord. Bane is the god of tyranny, and it makes sense he would want to expand his dominion to include orcs and goblin kind. Moreover, in 4th edition, uh, I don't really agree with this, but Maglubiet became a servant of Bane. So this could be like the lead up to that. Um, and perhaps Merch was successful on sort of, you know, stomping on the goblins on behalf of Bane, you know, in the 1300 timeline. Um, so as a quick aside, I've been working on a theory that, and I think I've talked about this before, each, or, each regional orc sort of area, like the Sword Mountains or the Lort Mills, uh, has their own cultures and they vary widely across Faerun. And the different gods of the Orcish pantheon play a dominant role in different areas. So in the realms, for example, you know, the orcs of the Sword Mountains north of Waterdeep are dominated by the clergy of Yurtris. Those clerics keep the Orcish population in line by infecting them with plagues and then doling out potions of delay disease. So presumably this theory might hold true amongst the Uraz of Orith as well, different cultures for different regions of orcs. So where would Merch be preeminent? Which local culture in the realms would he... Uh, focus on. It has to be a region where the orcs and goblins are more interested in warring amongst themselves than working in concert against their traditional foes, humans, elves, and dwarves. And so a few places come to mind. The first idea I had was perhaps the Earthspur Mountains of Impulter. In Dwarves Deep, which Ed wrote, we know that the stout folk of Earthfast in the Earthfast Mountains of Impulter are under attack from orcs and goblins. But we also know from the Bloodstone Lands that hobgoblins dominate in the nearby Giant Spire Mountains. Given that Earthfast doesn't fall, perhaps they got distracted in their attack, and it's perhaps because Merch led them off to a second war against the Hobgoblins. I think it's interesting, but I don't think it really fits. The second idea I had was perhaps his presence is related to the Battle of the Bones. This is fully described in the Elminster's Ecology's first appendix. And it was a horrific conflict between the Thugs of Uthor, a goblin-dominated army from the Goblin Marches, with orcs and goblins that battled an army of humans, dwarves, elves, halflings, and gnomes. It happened like 300 years ago in the year of slaughter, after a decades-long warming of the goblin marches undermined that goblin kingdom. So thousands died in the Battle of the Bones, but the lawkeeper races prevailed. Perhaps mercs rose out into power in the aftermath. Perhaps the orcs were so angry the goblins led them into failure that it sparked endless fighting. I still don't think this quite fit, but I do have a good idea I think that does fit. Let's look at the mines of Tethyamar. These are mines in the Desert Edge Mountains, just west of the Moon Sea. Uh, they were founded by the dwarves of the Iron House of Fallen Agrin uh, over a thousand years ago. And we know from Lost Empires of Faerun that the humanoid survivors of the Battle of Bones marched north into the Desert Mouth Mountains and lay siege to the dwarven realm of Tethyamar. They were manipulated by the Zentarum who revere Bane. We also know from that same source in the Grand History that Tethyamar falls to a legion of bloody, bloodthirsty bar guests and devils in the year of the Dark Dawn, summoned by a circle of circle magic of orc adepts and an archmage claiming to be the quote Great Hlundadim, which we know nothing about. So my thought was, what if the Great Hlundadim was actually an avatar of Merch, and the bar guests are lupine fiends that can take the form of a wolf or a goblin? What if Armeg is actually sort of this uber bar guest and uh, basically, they use the bar guests to like stomp down on the goblins and keep their population in check. 
We also know that Zentel Keep sees the citadel of the raven in the year of the harp. And with treachery and the aid of humanoids from Tethyamar and summon devils from the Nine Hells. So it seems like this great Hlundadim, if it was Merch, is bending a knee to Bane and serving the Zentarum, the Church of Bane, for him. So I think we have a place where Merch can fit in the realms. He's the preeminent orcish deity venerated in the minds of Tethyamar and worshiped there of Grumsh is outlawed. He secretly serves Bane. He keeps the goblinoids firmly under the boots of his orcish worshipers. And they work hand in gauntlet with the Zentarum, who are much more lawfully, and this whole culture is much more lawful than most other orc cultures in the realms. And, you know, the one-eyed god is pretty much forgotten. And the Church of Bane and the Zentarum can call on this isolated enclave of orcs whenever they want. So that's sort of how I would fit them in. And they probably fight alongside trained death dogs known as the spawn of Armeg at their side. One last little bit of Realm Slayer, then we'll finally get to Greyhawk. <laughs> so who is the black dragon that Merck's killed? I think the best candidate is Boglar Ma Manthor, better known as Acrid Tooth. We know he was active in the Marsh of Deception during the time of Netheril. And um, after uh, the, the desert sort of took over the area, perhaps he retreated to what became one of the, um, the isolated uh, springs. So you have a black dragon living in the desert in a cavern that's fed by a water source and doesn't even realize the surrounding land has turned to uh, uh, desert. And he would have been right in the way when the orcs marched north from the Battle of the Bones to take over Tethyamar. So probably Merch's avatar would have killed this dragon and, um, become, and that's where he got his dragon mail as well. Okay, so that's the realms. Let's talk about Greyhawk. Nice. That Ed approved? What? Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Just a thought. All right. Once again, I think we have a natural candidate for Merch to serve. The most likely de deity in Greyhawk is Hexter, who I think of as Greyhawk's most prolific pickpocket. You know, <laughs> six arms. Um, <laughs> sorry. We know from Bastion of Faith that Hexter is a lawful evil intermediate god known as the Scourge of Battle or the Champion of Evil. And, and we know from Bastion of Faith that he's a tyrant willing to employ any means available to enforce his will, no matter how much his subjects suffer. We also know from Bastion of Faith that his faith has been adopted by many humanoid tribes in service to Iridian masters. So the first location that came to mind for Merch to be active is Garel Enkdel, located in the westernmost arm of the Griff Mountains near Stonehall. Stonehold. According to the living Greyhawk Gazetteer, however, the preeminent deity of the orcs here is Grumps, so Merch would clearly be at the beginning of his campaign to overthrow the One-Eyed God. One thought to, that comes to mind is that Merch might masquerade as a Vatoon. Um, this doesn't necessarily work well with the idea of Hexter, though, because, you know, with Hexter being Iridian and Vatoon being a Sul God, and we already know that Ayuz was masquerading as Vatoon. But you could adjust the story slightly so that Merch was actually serving Ayuz, not Hexter, and that Ayuz directed Merch to masquerade as Vatoon with the eventual goal of overthrowing Grumps Ooh, and drawing the yeah. orcs of Garel Enkdel into his orbit. I like that idea. Mm -hmm. So it, it's an idea, maybe a bit of a stretch. A second possibility, though, is that Merch is active in the Pomarge. So according to the mm. original Greyhawk box set, the Drakenscrab hills are rumored to hide the resting place of, quote, one or more powerful creatures who may someday return to life. So we know from Dragon 167 that Krovos was one of the sleepers. And we know from Greyhawk Adventures and Slavers that the Earth Dragon was another one. So what mm -hmm. if there was a third? Perhaps Merge also slumbered beneath the Pomarge for centuries, only to be awoken by the arrival of the Orc and Goblin Hordes fleeing the Lord Mill Mountains during the Hateful Wars. I thought of you, Jay, when I came up with That's that. good. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank so, you. So Slavers discusses the rise of Turash Mach and reveals that his true identity was Theg Narlot, although I'm not sure that was preserved in later products, the former Slave Lord. And it talks about how Theg Narlot made a pact with the Earth Dragon, the lawful evil worm of the hills. So what if Turash actually made his pact with Merch, and that accounted for his rapid rise in power? Perhaps even Merch quietly slew the Earth Dragon and took his scales for his armor. You see, we're back to the armor again. Mm -hmm. And then assumed the Earth Dragon's guise, quietly guided by Hexter. So a, a usurper orc deity might account for how Turash Mach comes out of nowhere and suddenly commands an army of orcs, ogres, and gnolls. Note the absence of goblins. And it might also explain why goblins played such a small role in Turash's armies, even though they fled in large numbers during the Hateful Wars. 
So my biggest problem with this theory is it doesn't particularly explain why Hexter is interested in the Pomars as it kind of as that peninsula kind of lies outside the traditional Oridian domains. So perhaps we need to keep looking. So one more idea. A third possibility for Merck's focus of activity would be Spine Castle and the Bone Mark. Oh, there goes Gary's going to have a foot back, Gary Julian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So wow. Well, hopefully, I, hopefully, I got it right. So we know from the Living Greyhawk Gazetteer that the Bone March is ruled by a conclave of non-human chiefs, orcs, gnolls, and ogres, and that the influence of the North Province, now the North Kingdom, has led to greater organization and military effectiveness among these barbaric tribes. Sounds like they're lawful evil, not chaotic evil. Mm -hmm. We know from Dragon 63 that the orcs compose the Vile Rune and Death Moon tribes. And we know from Dragon 293 that Spine Castle fell suddenly to an invading army of orcs and gnolls and that Whisper spoke of a dark betrayal. Dungeon 148 reveals that human priests of Hexter are living and drinking alongside the humanoids in the aftermath of the invasion. And the living Greyhawk Gazetteer confirms that the betrayal was by none other than Grinnell, Herzog of the North Province. So we know from Bastion of Faith that the leaders of the orcs in Eastfair are admitted to the Cathedral of Hexter, an honor that might stem from Merksh's loyal service. And Dragon 293 also reveals that Grinnell, as the self-styled overking of the North Kingdom, might have divulged the secrets of Spine Castle's defenses to the Orcish chiefs of the Rakers, to whom he is now tenuous allied. And we know from the Living Greyhawk Gazetteer that Grinnell hopes to expand his holdings all the way to the Rakers. Mm -hmm. So, what if the six-armed god is backing Grinnell's plan to conquer all the territory up to the Rakers by bringing orcs of the region into the Church of Hexter? The orcs of the Bone March seem unusually organized and lawful. Perhaps their local culture is centered around the worship of Merch, served by bar guests to keep the local goblin population in check, and death dogs. Perhaps there was a grand bargain. What if Hexter slash Grinnell betrayed the Bone March and Spine Castle to the Orcish tribes Love that it. worshipped Merch? And in turn, Merch and the Orc chieftains agreed to bend a knee to Hexter and Grinnell. It could also be that Merch did a great favor for Grinnell. The, uh, I noticed in the descriptions of Bellport's mines in Ivid the Undying, there's a suggestion that they are frequently flooded and that pit props rot swiftly. So my thought was, what if up until recently, the depths of those mines were secretly home to a black dragon who kept wrecking the deepest mines? And what if Merch's avatar killed the black worm for Grinnell in order, in exchange for the secret to bypass Spine Castle's defenses? So anyhow, just a thought for a third one. So, so hopefully I've given you enough ideas to incorporate this obscure detail. Do you have those all written down? Yeah. Can you, just like Eddie, can you send that? I mean, because I know Gary yeah. when Gary Hulian sees the Spine Castle connection. Uh, he's either going to oh, love it is, or is it? Is, <laughs> no, he's going to hate it. <laughs> this is dynamite. I, I love all of them. Now I have the problem which one to go with. So you did some there. great, uh, unbelievable referencing too in there. So yeah. I want to uh, thank you so very much for that in-depth thought, Eric. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think I really like the Forgotten last Realms one. Like yeah, the last one. For yeah, no. Oh, and I, North Kingdom campaign. I think I like it. Yeah. I think I like it. Yeah, that's number one. I think, and I think the Pomarge one was number two, and I appreciate it. Uh, and and so Ed, Ed, you thought that the uh, Forgotten Realm stuff was fantastic too. I do. Okay, I awesome. do. Fantastic. So Lord that God. was that was my thought on an obscure deity that I think almost no one remembers. But yes, <laughs> I, will, uh, I will mail it to you, Jay, and you can share. Awesome. It with the world. Yep. <laughs> fantastic. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I know Eric's got Eric M's got some cool stuff too, right, Eric? You got the uh, you want to talk about the Stone Ring? What do you want? Which one do we go into first? Oh, we can either go about the Stone uh, Stone Ring, or we can talk about uh, more Druids of the Old Faith. Although let's do. They're very, they were written as co complementary articles. Let's do this. Let's do the Stone Ring because everyone. I think that's a great one. Everyone goes. What do I do with this? Right, Craig? Well, that was a question we had back in uh, the heady days of 2007, and I tried to answer it. Okay, let's, let's go for it. So uh, those who might not be aware, right outside of the city of Greyhawk is a stone ring, which is kind of like Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and uh, since I had done a whole lot of work with Bring the old faith up in, uh, Grey, uh, in living Greyhawk and the region of Jeff, I took a crack at it. And what we did is we came up with the idea that the 
old faith druids were moving back in. It was an old leftover remnant when they were worshipped throughout the entire, uh, the old faith was worshipped throughout the whole area, but they had uh, kind of gone into, had been supplanted by the newer gods. But of recent, uh, the old faith uh, gods had sent druids there to reestablish the uh, place as a holy site to start tending to the faith. And that was causing problems within the city itself. Try okay, here we go. Yeah, just we created a couple druids who were there who you could use uh, in the various campaigns if you were running Living Greyhawk campaigns. Wrong button! Yay! I apologize. Woohoo! There we go. Here's the stone ring. Yeah, it's over there. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, uh, location 07 on the old map. And it's uh, right by the uh, Overlooks Eerie's Trail. And it's just east of the Druid's Gate, which gives it, which gives that gate the name. Yep. And is uh, the sprawling Wainwright Manor occupies the flatlands just to the east of it. You can kind of see the manor <laughs> right up there to the side. With yeah. their faithful butler elf. More <laughs> 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 stately Wainwright Manor. <laughs> Sorry. And, and, and <laughs> no manners. It's yeah. fine. It's good, man. That was awesome. So, yeah. yes. so we came up with two druids. Uh, one that you would find there that would have two totally different purposes that you could use in the campaign because the idea was to give tools to the DMs who are running, running Living Greyhawk campaign adventures to pull them in as needed. And one of them was Theron the Splendid Holly which is one of the things we had done that whenever you became a druid of the old faith, you took a title, you dropped your surname and you became, you took a, uh, took a title of like the splendid Holly and Theron's thing was, uh, scanning what I had here. He was recently appointed by the great druid Hedelfer to attend the stone ring before the appointment. He served at one of the groves in the gnarly forest while the old faith community at the Stone Ring is smaller than where he was, he left it the opportunity to be the keeper of what many historians believe the most to be the most ancient stone circle in the Flaness. Theron has restored the circle to active use, leads services for, for the faithful, and advocated the old faith philosophy of the balance and the preservation of nature. Since arriving at the Stone Ring, he has begun a prolonged dispute with the miners, the nearby Cairn Hills, over the disposal of their slag. In addition, he has taken the directing oligarchy to task over the city's sewer system and the amount of pollution it dumps into the Siliton River. You do not want to drink out of the Siliton River downstream of Greyhawk, by the way. Um, and Nerof Gaskell has currently banned him from the mayor's office. Theron has reached an understanding with the woodcutters in the area, instructing them on how to collectively harvest instead of clear cutting of nearby forest lands. Raised from birth as a follower of the old faith, Theron embodies their ideals of patience and determination. He is well aware that his efforts in Greyhawk will not show much fruit for many years, but he is content to take as many years as needed. Theron enjoys lowbrow jokes and body songs as much as a dock worker in the river quarter. He's willing to cast druid spells for PCs at the prices listed in the player's handbook if they promise to uphold the balance. <laughs> So and that's what we have. Yeah, go for is it. Hmm? So the, again, we were trying to give tools to DM. And the next one is Jolene the Bounding Hare, who's an initiate of the Third Circle. If you remember, they uh, used to have uh, ranks for the Druids back in old days with the Druids. And yep. she was a Third Circle and is the daughter of Theron. She followed her father here when Hadelfer asked him to restore the Stone Ring. She has been slower to acclimate to their new home than Theron, and she misses the gnarly forest and the abundant wildlife there. She spends her days with her beloved animals, and at least once a week, Jolene tours the city to examine the car gargos of traders from far off lands for exotic animals that are only available at a crossroads, such as Greyhawk. So, are, are their theories on the Stone Ring? Who put it there? Oh, I had some. Well, let's see. Do, 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 do. Logged into the old faith deities, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah. The first one is that it was the old faith deities put it here. And it, uh, so it was just, this was a place of, because Great Hawk is built upon a very, on a crossroads in right. the Flanesse. 
Yep. And so people have been here for a long time coming and going. And so the stone ring was built by the Fone of the old faith long ago. That is the most common and um, mundane <laughs> of, the, uh, of the explanations for how it got here. Okay. Other ones that we came up with is it was not built by the old faith at all. Instead, it was erected by the Wind Dukes of Aqua. Ah, aha. Uh -huh. Who erected the stones millennia ago as a tomb in memory of one of their own that died at the Battle of Pesh, which legend says takes put, took place in the Cairn Hills nearby. Their, they buried their fallen brother with treasure, and this hidden trove contains clues on how to find one of the pieces of the Rod of Seven Parts. Nice. Okay. Wow. So, are you... Eric, are you gonna oh. are you gonna ask to place that in the Earth Journal, or are you gonna put that together so that we can give that out to the community here? Your call on that. I uh, haven't had a chance to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Until I got involved with my herb garden this yeah. afternoon as a good druid. Rick Miller asked. <laughs> uh, Rick Miller asked, "Is that linked to the Age of Worms?" Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, long. The, 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 uh, yeah, uh, was, was that was that some of the lore that was in Age of Worms, or uh, that you uh, tied into it, or is it that that was your own that was your own? Uh, I, I think this was written before they published Age of okay. Worms. This was back in two thousand eight. Okay. Uh, when did Age of Worms come out? I'm Age of Worms came out two thousand six, two thousand five. Well, I, I guess think. it was ahead of me then. Yeah. Um, I not overtly that I know, okay. because I was trying to keep to uh, directly just to. Greyhawk lore that I had established. Rick's a fun of knowledge. Greyhawk as opposed to Paizo, uh, Paizo Hawk. Yeah. No, I love it, man. I love that stuff. And and there's all these the strange things, uh, anomalies out there. And if it's tied into the old faith, or, or or you can go two different directions here, and that's fantastic, Eric. Just let yeah. let me know. That's if you... one another one was is the kick it around the idea that it was actually a uh, portal to the uh, realm of the Cat Lord. Ah, and this I is like how that. Cat Lord. I love yeah. yeah. That's a good one, too. Uh, yeah. That's great. It would only happen on nights of uh, the half moon. When the uh, moon is halfway between darkness and light, that the uh, Cat Lord can turn sideways and step through the Trillathons at the Stone Ring. So it and could, enter into a earth. It could actually be both. It could actually be the Druids are attempting to do, uh, you know, do their thing with the Old Faith, but actually that's what it really is. Yes, every good portal should go to at least two destinations <laughs> if, you should, if you don't use it right. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, at the very least, we're just going to put in the uh, access that the druids have to the ways of the world, which was something we introduced in Jeff and made use of. Which is uh, all these portals are interconnected, all these rings are connected to each other, and yeah. the druids have special paths that they can step through the Trillathons and go into the ways of the world and quickly travel from one stone ring to the next. Yeah. Yeah. And I put, I put that similar idea into the realms before it was a D and D setting that there were gates that uh, networks of gates. And the problem was if, if you stumbled upon them and started using them, the people who already controlled them wanted you dead and gone in a hurry because they didn't want anybody else to know about them. Speaking of that, Eric B, you're you're uh, you're in right. The um, that's that's a gate to almost everywhere, right? Yes, not mine originally. Just to be clear, uh, the world the world serpent inn first appeared in Tales from the Infinite Plains. Yes, it was OP one, which I think means it was first edition, but it might have been second edition. Second um, edition, it was second. Yeah, yep. so it it showed up in the city of Arabelle and Cormier. Uh, as the uh, all but abandoned wild goose inn, um, but if you walk through the door, you ended up in this sort of extra dimensional awesome. plane hopping tavern called the World Serpent Inn. And I'm blanking on the issue number. It was like 351 or something like that. I got asked to sort of update it and uh, redo it for um, third edition, which I did. It was a lot of fun. Um, it does include links to Greyhawk, of course. Uh, Iron Gate. One in Iron, Iron Gate. Yes. And I and I got to bring back my favorite character from the Rogues Gallery. Yeah, Cobb Cob Dark? No. No, no, no. The Lizard Man, Phoebus. Oh, Phoebus. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Just loved that artwork. I 
always wanted to play that character. Mm. It's really <laughs> the great. In the trident. <laughs> so, so as you can see, I'm so glad that we did get together two hours late on this because all this is all this is meant to be thought provoking for everyone out there watching for your own campaigns. Mm -hmm. That's yep. exactly what this discussion's about. And then Eric and Erica brought some wonderful stuff to the table. What's Ed got? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that both you guys delve deep into the lore and history. Because this time around, I went the other way. I did little nuts and bolts that you can use at the gaming table. Awesome. So let's start with the Greyhawk one. Because, hey... Jay, Jay went through hell tonight, and he deserves a pay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Okay, so here we go. For Greyhawk, the ritual of undying. Hmm. Uh-oh. There is a ritual in invoking the goddess Weejas, in which a supplicant gives some of their blood, they need not be the caster of the ritual, and dedicate themselves verbally to the goddess. This ritual is known only to a few high-ranking Karuth, and they usually only agree to cast it on mortals who have done Weejas, or the Karuth, a valuable service. The ritual invisibly marks the supplicant as a favored of Weejas, a mark that can only be seen by Karuth, though all Jasdeen will sense the supplicant is special, and in some favorable way. An undying can indeed die, but no matter what the circumstances of their passing, they will rise as an undead, of a sort of undead of their own choosing, and a, an existing undead type they have personally encountered, not something they merely imagine, or a fanciful catalog of undead abilities they like, want, without having to undergo the usual means of becoming such an undead. Moreover, if they are destroyed as an undead, no matter how and in what state their remains end up, they will coalesce and return as an undead 2d12 days later and can choose to come back as the same sort of undead or another sort of undead, again, familiar to them from a personal encounter. No matter how many times they are destroyed as undead, they will return, retaining all of their memories, including how their destruction felt. Oh, man. An undying is always free-willed as undead and will remain so. They cannot be dispelled or compelled by any magic or known ability that can command or influence the behavior of undead, with one exception. Every time they return by the grace of Weejas, they owe the ruby sorceress an obligation, a task or mission she will command them to do, usually appearing in their minds to do, rather than in person. They retain their free will and can delay carrying out this mission. But if they do so through their next destruction, they return racked with pain. And this agony will grow every time they are destroyed before their mission is fulfilled. And of course, every return brings upon them a new obligation. Weejas has no interest in tormenting undying by commanding them to carry out impossible missions. Rather, she wants things done, and she regards the undying as the most trustworthy, expendable servants she can get to do those things. Many undying spend time as vampires, liches or demi-liches, gaining the undead abilities of the form, but not any magical skill or spells they didn't learn before achieving it. Undying need not progress from one undead form to a more powerful one upon each destruction. They can choose a less powerful form. At least one undying, who began as a human Karuth known as Gordemor, now customarily uses the form of an undead beholder. Nice. There you go. Thank you for adding in lens, one of Lens deities. There, there you go. That was awesome. Yeah. And it ties into the cool, even the undying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, and a lot of people don't realize that we Ja, we Ji, as 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 Len always said, yeah. Uh, yeah. is evil. She's yeah. lovely, lovely evil tenant. She's evil. You know, guys yeah. of magic and death. Yeah. She's so. just mostly evil. Mostly evil, yeah. So uh that was that was super cool. 
app. <laughs> She's mostly evil. Mostly, mostly yeah, evil. Just I the front-facing parts. See, I it. say that because, if I remember right, in the original write-up in Dragon, she was listed as lawful neutral, parentheses yep. Yep. evil, which yep. is how they used to kind of say mostly evil yeah <laughs> yes yeah. that's how they skirted well you know maybe she's uh that was her most popular uh alignment for all her villains too was chaotic mutual little evil yes so all the stuff didn't work on them because then you can get away yeah, with it you can get characters like that in adventuring parties and they're not like you know uh, i i understand back in the day but uh that's really cool uh, Ed, thank you for that. And I'm assuming that uh, no we'll get we'll get that in the uh, in our I special Discord. It. Yes. Well, I was going to send it to your Comcast. Oh yeah, Is you can email okay? it to me. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You got my email. Yeah, definitely. That's yeah. a great way to do it. So, um, who wants to go next with something? Uh, do you guys, t you guys, tell me when when what time you want to all bolt out because we're so yeah. late. Please. I can I can go with this uh, theory on the Earth Dragon. Please. That ties into a little bit to, to the rules that I set up for my campaign on, on how gods are made and how they're killed, so to speak. And and, and so and gods can basically be created in two different ways in my campaign. They can either be ascending creatures or they can be emerging powers, so to speak. And descending creatures is that if you have a creature that is powerful enough to, to start dominating or be f either feared or worshipped by a large amount of, of creatures, then they can they can start gaining they, powers that are beyond the mortal realm, so to speak. And, and they can stop aging and, 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 and start ascending the, the, the steps towards divinity, so to speak. That's one way of doing it. And the other way is that you can have phenomena that can be if enough people believe in something in it, and and have that wonderful when when you have almost like fey creatures and and you have the spirit in the well or whatever things like that if you have enough people that go around fearing something or believing in something the sun or or, or a spirit in the tree or whatever it is that gets makes that thing gain power so to speak over time that's usually a much slower process but it comes and and the earth meaning we have Cuthbert and Mayaheen and stuff as a sent example in my campaign of ascending deities that 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 be, were mortals that that kind of be powerful enough and worship and or you can also be be sponsored by another deity to be risen up in, into the ranks of divinity as a helper or, or so, so on and so forth. But the earth dragon, I have it as an emerging power. And it's an old one, a really old one, because it's one of these areas in the world that has been habitual, a good place to live for millennia, whether it's been an ice age or warm climate, and it's far, far up enough from the, 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 the sea, so to speak. So there is a, a, the climate has been good and steady and stuff for many, many millennia. So it's been, people have lived there for a very, very long time. And there's been a volcano there for a long time too. And the people started worshiping the volcano because they they kind of saw that as, as powerful and, start, and that kind of started to make power into it. And of course, one person started to see dragons eventually. And maybe there was a gold, <laughs> gold dragon or red dragon that moved in there once in a blue moon thousands of years ago and they started worshiping it and that took off and and slowly and steadily the the mountain got its power and it started manifest and people believed that was a dragon living there and eventually it's slowly emerging and and it's been forgotten several times and then it tends to come back again so there is something living in the mountain that thanks to enough prayers or and fear and now we have a lot of of humanoids there and they definitely believe that something is in there and they are creating a cult and one day we might have an emerging power coming there that is based on on all these beliefs and fears and stuff over millennia and i'm not really sure what i will have emerged but it will be something so to speak because joe you know, block campaign. joe block has a theory of crovis there Right? Okay, yes, yeah, I know yeah. that is many different series, but yeah. that is a way, and I, it's just an example. I'm not sure I will actually go with it in my campaign, but it's an example of how you can you can start tweaking something and, and make things happen. And you can start with small spirit in the well or the, the old oak. I have outside the, 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 the village of Aldit, there is a very old oak that has been worshipped by Flan 
for millennia. And that one, that oak has a spirit. And the Iusian priest tried to burn it and, and it came back again. And 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 other things, nasty things have happened around it to Iusian priests and others. So the Iusian, the Iusian priest fear it now. So so they but they don't they're so scared. The low level priests that are there are so scared they don't dare to call for a backup because that will be to admit defeat to a tree. And, and so they don't dare to, so they don't say it, tell anyone and they go around and have nightmares about it and try to come up with new things. And they, they try to take victims and hang them up in the tree and, and do all sorts of nasty stuff to see what comes out of the, the tree, so to speak, and the tree spirit. So they're terrified of it. And the villagers who survived there, they're starting to worship the tree and say, damn, yeah, the tree, the, the clerics are scared of it. So it's something good in the tree and, and, and it brings. And the, the, one of the reasons is that that tree, there is two sets of, of, of mass graves near the tree. One was the, the, the first one was the villagers that lived there when Halmada, the cruel, that thought he was Vecna uh, uh, incarnated. He got the hand and the eye of Vecna and he ruled that area. That's part of, of, of Greyhawk lore. And he was called Halmada, the cruel. And he ruled the area. So when he invaded, he simply killed off the villagers and buried them outside the walls near that tree. And then when the Shieldlanders came back and outrooted Halmara, they took all the Halmara people and, and, and murdered them, killed them off and ritually buried them outside the walls. And that has also influenced it. So the tree is, it has both a nasty side and a good side and, and it's growing and it's getting more and more power very slowly, very gently over time. That's another example of how you can introduce weird cool little creatures and it can it, the tree doesn't need to have any power by itself it can just attract other power Faye likes to live there undead sees a drawing to it and stuff like that you can certain magic can be enhanced other types of magic can be subdued for instance and stuff like that so 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 you can kind of play with these things in your campaign and build using history and and a few game mechanics and and off you go so to speak so do you do you think in Greyhawk that um, certain regions are special and have more of these, or do you think that every region has a few and we just don't know about most of them? I think we we there is all sorts of flavor, and it varies over time because people get displaced. So after migrations, when there's new people coming in, meaning they bring in their ideas, their beliefs, and they also build their temples. And, and temples that, things that are in areas and, and buildings that are sacred and to a god and stuff, they gain power as the god gained power, so to speak. That's why they, they build towers and stuff, because the god can see and experience through their symbols and stuff. So, so that's why they compete on building the biggest, most impressive temples and stuff like that. So, so that have a tendency of, of, of kind of rubbing off on the area. And then you have old beliefs that are almost dead and that comes back again and, and so on. Cults need to, gods that are almost forgotten, they need to maintain their presence so they're not completely forgotten by cults. So they need to, to have a few priests that goes out and, and make new converts to the faith in order to, to maintain their powers, so to speak. It's an interesting and, concept. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's how I, I, I play with my gods. So that powers is trying to persuade enough useful fools to, to, to worship them, but they can go either way. They can either worship, have people worship and respect you or fear you. So you can go either way. You can have a, a few priests like Nero and Erythnol and others. They have a few priests whose only mission is to go out and make people scared of you, uh, so to speak. That's their mission. They, they, that's, they can recruit a few priests but the only need, the only purpose of the priest is to make people scared and make the message so people fear the god or the, the power in question, so to speak. We're going to talk about liches on Wednesday night there, uh, CT yeah. Pips, too, as well. So I'm going to get in trouble here. Are you ready? <laughs> I have to. I can't help myself. You're talking about the hand of it. How dare you take the hand of away from Joe Manginello, Anna? Oh, okay. I did. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, like, no, yeah. no, 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 she didn't. I have the, I have the hand of Vector. <laughs> you have it in the case there right you there. Go. there. You see, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you took it. <laughs> I yeah, well, myself. I have the head of, I have the head of Vector, so I got you all top. Oh, <laughs> That's wow. awesome. Oh, you got to get a head. Oh. Is it oh. one or two eyes in it? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. In my home not game, I, I, we didn't quite get to that. that. Somehow the campaign that. keeps ending. Uh oh. Yeah. Damn. It's kind of like in uh, how relics were in medieval medieval Catholic Church, where everyone had a, a relic. Yeah. And everyone had a piece of Vecna. All the churches of Vecna had one piece of them, and you're not quite sure <laughs> yeah. if it's mm-hmm. a fake or not. Ah, yeah. yeah. uh, mm-hmm. that was the first thing I ever had censored out. I did an adventure at an early Gen Con in which the party could find the foreskin of Vecna. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when they find it, it out. Yeah. Uh, in a reliquary, I hasten to add. That's and so and awesome. they, they triumphantly come out with the with the foreskin of Vecna. And this priest goes, No, you got sold a fraud because and he whips out from under his robes. This is the foreskin of Vecna. And behind him, this older priest listening with an ear trumpet. So no, I have it. It's the guy with his elbow who says, No, I have the older two foreskin. <laughs> and then it goes on and on. Oh, I'm Brian on. and your mother is too. And, so and you submitted that? <laughs> no, no, I didn't submit it. I ran it. I oh, ran wow. it. Oh, wow. Yep. That's oh, awesome. my gosh. And and it was it was Len who said, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and 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 I said, um, "Do you want to hear the the line again?" <laughs> and he said, "He said no." Who said that, Len or or Gary? Yeah, Len. Oh Len. my gosh, that's so awesome! Oh no, Gary was killing himself laughing. Oh. He was like doubled over. Oh, he thought it was gosh. hilarious. And Len was going, "Do you know what the implications are?" Oh and, my gosh! I wish we had that, was, vi- that recorded. Oh my oh, god! Oh my god, that was hilarious. But it was such an early Gen Con. There was no press. Right. Well, okay. Local Lake Geneva would wander by once during the day with a still camera. Right. You know, to 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 get the costumes and so on, and say, yeah, the crazy people were here again at the Horticultural wow, Hall this my weekend. Gosh. You know, but, but it was not interested in what we actually we were actually doing. Yeah. 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 So but, that's one for the know, books, everyone. That story. That is. <laughs> yep. That's uh, that's up there. That but is, I was just having fun. That's you know, so like, awesome. Uh, I have the foreskin effect. No, oh, I have the. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, Gary thought it was hilarious. Yep. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Now we can add that to the Vecna lore. Oh, you know I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm gonna yes, I'm gonna push that. Oh god. So um Yes, now uh Whiz Kids, how much do you think that would go for? Uh yeah, that's <laughs> either a lot or, or, or not much at all. Uh, not much at all, yeah. yeah. What a wonderful one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So Ed, Ed, you 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 gotta have some. Uh, I know you gave me one for Greyhawk, but you gotta have a Forgotten Realms, a little tidbit sure. there too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Give it okay. to the for- FRs. Yep. Okay. The Order of the Unicorn. Oh, okay. There are some doppelgangers who worship Larue, and they form a secret priesthood that works to garden the realms to help breed and protect beasts whose populations are dwindling so that population explosions and crashes tied to numerical inequalities will become rare or unknown. Thanks to natural disasters and upheavals, such as the time of troubles and the second sundering, and wars, these are all too frequent. This priesthood, however, has been very successful in its efforts. They have worked almost unseen and unknown for more than a century, have prevented orc hordes becoming a frequent scourge during this time, and have help flatten some of the peaks and valleys of populations, population swaps as a beer and toral pass through each other and in the wake of that. Most doppelgangers have heard of the order as it's a source of bemusement and amusement to many of the race, inspiration to others, and a wistful way out to some. If an individual is interested in joining the order and shares so much as a hint of this, with another doppelganger, the order usually hears of it sooner rather than later and arranges an unwitting test to try to discern the motives, degree of ruthless selfishness, really, of the individual. If they pass this test, in quotation marks, they'll be formally contacted and given a formal test in the form of a mission, not to mention an initiation that consists of a few recognition phrases used by the order, which change frequently, by the way, and time spent as a unicorn among unicorns. 
after shifting into unicorn shape. This experience usually imparts a deeper sense of life cycles and the interconnectedness of all living things in the initiate. initiate. Full members of the order start to dream of LaRue and learn how to call her by certain whispered words in the moonlight. She usually sends her voice into the minds of members to guide and confer and bestows spells directly into member minds that can be cast by speaking her name and willing the spell to be released. Most have to do with healing, concealment, teleportation, or minor creations of living things. But LaRue and priests can also locate object if they need items rather than living things, uh, summon herds of unicorns, and use moonbeam delivery combat magic and shielding slash armor spells. LaRue and Order members also have local goals centered on thwarting or slowing those who despoil the land and destroy forests, or overhunt, or foul water sources. LaRue has a particular hatred and fear of drought and desert conditions, and the spread of deserts, as well as wanton pollution, mine tailings being left untreated and cover, uh, covering ever more land, uh, for example. So powerful Laruan priests gain spells that allow a unicorn to ride the sky by fly, by galloping on thin air. And they often use this to aid unicorns they ride as mounts. Cast on themselves, it allows them to walk on thin air, ride the winds, gliding and controlling their own weight as they do so to affect their rate of falling, and even rise if they locate a thermal and control their own shapes and actions properly. The order tends to work more as self-willed secret agents who aid each other when they meet and have common cause rather than a hierarchical formal priesthood. But veterans and those with greater magic abilities bestowed by LaRue dominate newcomers and those of lesser magic. There are some roving watchers for LaRue who are formidable adventurers among the order. And these include the doppelgangers known as Moranks, Thu and Vothra. Tiddlypop. Nice. Very cool. Um, that sounds right up uh, Eric M's alley there, right? Oh, yeah. I love all yeah. that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. LaRue is a great goddess. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was so... F that, that That is part of my... I, okay, I have lots of bloodlines in my past. That's part of my English bloodline, the lion and the unicorn from the nursery rhyme. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made sure there was all, a... Dates so all made, the way back to Dragon 54 again. <laughs> that's right. Yep. Yep. I looked, I, uh, and that's one of those dragons I don't have on my computer. I was going to bring up that article, but I can't, and I apologize for that. So, so um, that's awesome, Ed. So, uh, Eric or Eric, you guys either have anything uh, you, you want to uh, discuss here? I know we'll wind down a little bit because I know we're running super, super late because of my uh, missed, uh, issues tonight. But um, Eric B? So I think um, what, you know, I've been writing some adventures for my campaign, um, hoping to put them on DM Guild one of these days. Uh, but one of the things that I've been kind of looking into is uh, Ed and I were talking about this while we were uh, waiting to get this started earlier this evening. Um, as I start putting together some temples um, that are different than you might expect, like Timora, the goddess of good luck, or Mask, the goddess of thieves, or whatever it might be, you know, it's kind of interesting to go through the monster manuals and all the old dragons and polyhedrons, try to find creatures that would make sense in temples and um okay. it's actually in some cases like bane it's really easy right ed created beholders that belong in there bane dead bane guards dire guards there's tons of stuff um but other gods it's it's much much tougher uh to figure out like what goes in the tomb of my which is akin to uh like eldath in greyhawk right um, what would a temple of that look like? And what would the guardians be? You don't expect that there would necessarily be undead, but there's probably something. So um, I guess what I'm getting at is that one, for me, it's becoming an increasing source of new ways, new monsters to create is to take the deities, look at their churches and think about 
Well, if I was an adventurer wandering around in the crypts or sneaking into the temple in the middle of the night, both good or evil deities, what would you see? What would you run into? What would be the monsters in addition to the human and demi-human priests? Um, so one that came to mind recently dragging um, really far back was, um, you know, I had a temple of Timora and I was trying to put some stuff in there. And Ed alluded to this earlier that in the realms, there used to be Taiki, right? And then TSR decided that we couldn't have Taiki. And so she was split into uh, Timora and Bashaba, goddess of good and bad luck. Um, and you sort of have the equivalence in Greyhawk as well. And so I said, well, what if we took that event and said there's some magical spill off, right? And so what would be the spawn that came out of the split? And the idea I came up with is there's a first edition monster. It was repeated a couple times and then dropped. It looks like a golden kitty cat with green, big green eyes. And it's called a luck eater. And so my thought was that luck eaters are actually the spawn of the split of Taiki into Timora and Bishaba. Mm. And they wander around, particularly in the temples of both of those deities. And both faiths hold them as sacred because they're kind of tied into Taiki. So you're not allowed to kill them. And for those who don't remember the first edition luck eater, basically it's a cat that tries to make friends with you and then it incites you into combat. So if you're not fighting monsters, you're fighting each other. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 it has abilities that kind of keep you from attacking it directly. And so that's the kind of thing I could imagine wandering around in the catacombs of uh, a temple of Timora. And so it's fun to kind of take the other gods and see what monsters you can come up with that would make sense in a faith-specific setting that aren't just your old classics of Ayuz or Bane or, or, or Thera's Dune, if that makes sense. So anyhow, just a thought on monsters. Great. So, um, Eric, then I have a couple questions for the general group. I, I, for my own self-aggrandizement, I have to ask. So, <laughs> is that one over to me then, Jay? Sure. All right. This one I wanted to share with you is something we've been working on with Baldman Games and nice. the Moonshade's Rising Shadows campaign story. So instead of Greyhawk, we're over into uh, Forgotten Realms. And this one involves my thoughts on the Earth Mother of the Moonshays. Okay. So at the culmination of this adventure, and there's a little bit of a spoiler here, but it's not too much, you pass through the memories and the emotions of the Earth Mother herself. And in the course of the adventure, in the final adventure where you're tier three, you've gone through 20 trilogies. This is the big culmination of the entire campaign. I would like to read this a little bit to you. It's short. Please. Bear with me. Please. Kimri, that is your name. You are young, newly made. Around you are your siblings, drops of power, mo uh, motes of blood. A myriad of stars shine on you as you dance through the cosmos. Your creator leads the way, ever moving, ever changing not content with a single form. Through infinite skies, he makes and creates with an abandon. You admire that. You wish to emulate that, to create, to nurture, to grow. You whisper three thoughts to your sister. She listens kindly, but she does not understand. She cannot see in her mind's eye the verdant dream. Strife rages amongst the children. One of the blood has sparked rebellion against the creator. Sibling has turned on sibling. You want no part of it. Your sister has taken a name, Ordolf. She is afraid for you. The cosmos is vast. You will be lost without the creator. You agree, it will be terrifying. But the verdant dream is worth the risk. You plunge down, down, down into an ocean rich with life. You rise up islands. They will need rain, lots of rain to drape them in green. You will create, 
you will nurture, they will grow. And that was our origin story of the Earth Mother. Nice. As Very one nice. of the uh, blood of Corellan Lorethian that was spilled as he was walking through the cosmos. And she pretty much no blamed out whenever there was the great fight between the uh, Corellan and Lolf or Arashne. And instead she was to make her own path. And that led to the creation of the moon chase. I am trampling all over the flowers of Ed's garden. I apologize <laughs> in advance. <laughs> but it worked for our story. And we went heavily with the idea that Earth Mother is not Shantea, that she's a primal. And that is why she constantly has the problems of her moon wells being corrupted because she does not have a, de a deity rank. And that does that way means her power can be corrupted easily and why she has problems with Kazgaroth rising up and why, why that she needs heroes to protect her moon wells because she cannot do it herself because she's not actually a god. She's the primal spirit of the moon chase. Eric, that is um, super cool. And is that more mm -hmm. that going to come out in, uh, in upcoming publications from Baldman? CCC BMG Moon 20, okay. which is a uh, campaign creator content, Bold Man Games, and the 20th trilogy of the Moonshay, uh, Rising Shadow Story. So it's the end. As you are facing off against... Spoiler. Uh, <laughs> awesome. To fight for the future of the Moonshays. Now, one thing we had to do is... I don't know if there are... Uh, is, how do you, uh, we were really going with the final encounter, the final adventure is a giant battle interactive that goes for, it's a fight that goes for four hours at a convention. And we were trying to think of how would the Earth Mother fight? And the answer is she tried to out heal the opponent uh, until the opponent just has nothing left and she just continues to uh, absorb and to, to be resilient and to heal herself and her fellows and all of her druids and all the party members. And so it's uh, instead of defeating the bad guy, because you cannot defeat the bad guy for reasons that we discussed earlier in this little uh, get together. <laughs> yeah. Instead, you just have to wear that person out until he just collapses exhausted as the Earth Mother endures and the Earth Mother preserves. And so by having how you structure your deity and how your deity shows up, or in this case, not deity shows up, is how you can structure the story and your combats and how your adventure would go. I love how those inform each other. And it's, making up a heel fight yeah, was a fun time. That's a... Uh... That sounds like the, uh, some of those uh, wow fights with the Torian druids just heal, 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 and you can never kill them. Heal. And it's like, oh heal. my God, it's never going to end. <laughs> Life bloom. Life oh bloom. Oh my gosh. You understand. Yeah, exactly. Wow. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, I appreciate you sharing you. that. So, so here are my questions real quick here. Who was responsible for setting these up? Because if you, as everyone knows, if you're not stealing, you're not trying, right? So I, these three deities are in my Grail campaign. Leviator, right? Who, Ed, is that you putting Leviator yep. in Forgotten Realms? Yeah. You, you just liked her so much from these demigods, right? Is that what happened? And you're like, this, she's badass, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, that was as close as I could get to, um, Provocative, dangerous sex. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> no, no, I was trying to put in all the human triggers. Right. Oh, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pain I mean, to pain. You know, I mean, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pain. Uh, the, uh, the revenge. You know, the princess bride. I want my father back, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Everybody can relate. You know, um, and, and the, the joy of creation, you know, when you, you hold your newborn right. child in your arms for the first time, all these things that are triggers. And that's one of the, tri I wanted to have a representative for each one of them. 
Well, uh, yeah, that's uh, and Leviator fits that. I have Leviator's the the head deity from uh, one of the two deities that Heisey, the god of evil, um, which is finished as well from uh, in my Dark Brotherhood group because they just they just fit the pallid hand. So they I, fit. I yep, yep, absolutely. And I, I just and I've had these deities in even before the uh, you know the Gary Gygax uh, articles, right? I, I go back to mm-hmm. eighty in that box. It's eighty three. Number two, uh, Talos. Who I have is a stor- the Storm Lord in Greyhawk. Who is is that you too, Ed? On Talos? Talos, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. The destroyer, yeah. the raging one, uh the storm. I have him as I have him as more as CAC neutral of evil tendencies. So I can get away with especially priests playing <laughs> that. I don't want to yeah, yeah. So okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants to destroy. He, he's almost amoral. It is destruction for its own sake. It's not destruction to hurt people or bring them low he doesn't care okay it's destruction for destruction's sake yeah i I think of him as like i was saying with the ruathan pantheon that i had written up earlier i think of talos as playing the role of um sort of that elder greek titan just you know rampaging fury um just destruct it, it's not even evil so much as just destruction yeah. he's technology um, though a little too though correct or is that, am I getting that wrong? Or he's just just wanting destruction? No, yeah, yeah. Gond is more the one who who approaches okay. technology. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, that um, another one uh, that I I love because uh, you know we have a lot of elementalists and a lot of uh, weather effects of spells that are, that are utilizing that player's option book, which you know so well about. You know, Eric, all the stuff for de- developing specialty priests, not just one I loved uh, loved to do. The last one, and you, you kind of talked about this earlier. And it, you don't. It's someone from internal. You think it's Jeff Grubb? Maybe the the Red Knight. I I love because now Stratus is that dead guide in between Hexter and Heronius and D, you know, the lawful neutral. But I thought Red Knight fit there. I don't know who came up with Red Knight. It might even have been Barb Young from from who was then the an editor on the magazines. Okay. Because because uh, Tempest was uh, the Lord of Battles. Right. And I think there was um, the desire. For two things, um, have a female side to to being a badass fighter, so that goes in, and strategy, battlefield strategy, right? The Red Knight from the chessboard, and and that, um, I think that was. But yes, the Red Knight was put in in house by TSR yeah. in the second edition campaign box set. Was the first time she appeared, yeah. if I remember correctly. Oh, uh, yeah. She, and the, she and here. I, She's in I, Powers of Pantheons. No, no, I know, but I'm saying Before the original. That. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so I'm a little bit of a stickler of not making stuff up if I don't have to. So I like to find like a, a very short write up and then expand it, like I was talking about earlier, right? So the Red Knight had a very short write up. The first one I think was in the second edition campaign set, and of course when I saw that one paragraph, I'm like, okay, now I got to turn it into a thing. Mm-hmm. So. Um, that's where you got the three or four pages on her from okay. was, was me taking that one paragraph, got trying it. to okay. expand it. And the, the, I may have mentioned this before, but the funny aspect of it is normally I do not use real people's names. Um, I happen to slip in a real person's name who happens to be my niece, uh, <laughs> in that right, in that write up. Oh, nice. Which, uh, well, unexpected consequences, uh, the number one thing that came up when you Googled her name was that right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad thing. Wow. So it was kind of funny. And, and you what, gave her a mythology to live up to. Exactly. Yeah. One last thing I wanted to say, and I think this is to you, Eric B. These books all have specific spells for each deity. Mm-hmm. And you wrote most of them. Um, I think Ed wrote a decent number okay, of Okay, so is that... Av- and you Ed, have Ed, Ed, okay. Ed, in Face and Avatars, Ed wrote them. Okay. I think... I, it, my memory's a little fuzzy, so Great. correct me if I'm wrong, Ed. I think I wrote most of them in Demi-Human Deities and yep. Powers and Pantheons. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I handed them to Julia for the first book, but the second and third books was Eric doing his thing and me sitting back and grinning. <laughs> well, yeah, because Seeking Swords in here, I know that's you, Ed, right? Um, uh, Exaltation, Mesa Odo, they're all Helm, right? I believe. Are they Hel- Is that Helm? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, and some of those yep. snuck in from Ed's pages from the Mages article. That's so. right, yeah. yeah, okay. All right, that's... Ma- yeah. Mace, Mace of Odo came from 
one of the early priest books he put in the pages from mages in the right. in dragon magazine but and of course thing? that's from history odo bishop odo right you're you're on 1066 Norman conquest and any british schoolboy it's a schoolboy howler odo oh oh don't you know oh wow okay did not know that <laughs> And, and I should point out that, you know, Ed has a reputation that everybody knows. And so the editors were always watching him really carefully. Yes. <laughs> and yes. I, I did not have that same reputation. So I actually <laughs> snuck in a spell yeah. that is far worse than anything Ed ever got into print. What is I it? Oh, say. what is it? Where is it? Um, oh. It's in the write-up of Shares. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know which one. Intens intensify orgasm or whatever the heck that thing is no, or something like I that. I didn't use that word. Yeah, but I that's what it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I knew exactly. Yeah, I, I see it. I just said intensify yeah. sensation. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you meant. I knew exactly. Because <laughs> uh, we, we uh, I use Shares, too, because Walt, who's, Walt, my buddy Walt, is a little offbeat sometimes. Uh, yeah, we have Sharas as another, uh, you know, another deity we utilize. So I knew exactly where you were going with that. Nice, Eric. That is. So, so you let Ed get all the get in trouble. <laughs> you can, yep. sneak, you can yep. sneak in anything yep. that you want. Oh, that's yeah. so funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh my I, gosh. I, I run interference. <laughs> and, well, actually, that that actually brings up a very good point because when we were writing novels, we used to put in sacrificial lamps which were scenes we knew would be cut by the editor <laughs> because they were so over the top. And That's... the idea was you did four or five egregious <clears throat> sacrificial lambs. And then having cut all that and made the book it's too short, they'd let, they'd let the milder ones in. And of course I was also <laughs> doing it as a, as a um, entertainment and reward for the poor cubicle workers at TSR upstairs in the cuba in the Q-tip <laughs> factory, because they, they would go to, they would get my discs they go to the Mac room, stick the disc in the Mac room, print it out, everything printed to the Mac, which was the only thing that could handle printers <laughs> in those days. Um, and this giant box of fan fold printing would print everybody's print jobs. So everybody would go to the room and tear off on the perforations their print job, take it back, have this huge stack, and they have nowhere in their cubicle to set it down in most cubicles. So they'd back up from their computer and put it in their lap Thanks, and start editing by reading and they get to one of my sex scenes and they just tear off the perforation <laughs> and then they'd flip 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 to the end of that and they tear off the perforation again <laughs> they'd set the stack aside and then the tradition was the gals would stand up on their chairs in cubicle land and begin to read a sex scene <laughs> but, but you'd read it like a Midwestern dignified, or no, an English dignified preacher. And so it came to pass that her arousal was heard from the rooftops, and it was good. Oh, those are you know, the and, 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 and of course, everybody in Cubicle Ed would stop what they were doing and listen and have a good laugh and then go back to their, and then the editor would take that little section and shove it in their purse or their drawer to take home because it was not gonna go into the book. And the problem, I had to stop doing that because they got a new junior editor in once and, uh, and they were right on deadline and all the sacrificial lambs went through into print. <laughs> Which book was that? Uh, no, I, I but draw the veil of decency over it because <laughs> it was caught after one printing. Oh, and, so that's like a rare And I, I, I was vilified um, by certain oh, people. And I said, well, I just wanted to make sure your editors were actually doing their jobs. You mm -hmm. should be thanking me for this. And uh, they somehow didn't see it that way. Can't imagine why. <laughs> Welcome, Dead Aussie Gamer. Yeah, that, that so uh, that's a great story. Uh, um, and, uh, and Eric, man, that's that took some nerve there putting that 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 spell. That spell is exactly what it is, man, mm -hmm. because because uh, he uses it all the time. <laughs> I, I didn't think it would make it in print, I'll be honest. Yeah, we oh, see a sacrificial lamb. Oh my gosh. Man, <laughs> I, me having open high and Alona get busy is mild <laughs> compared to what you guys do. <laughs> it was a different right. time. It was a different it's time, it. Eric. 
So we're, we're talking, we're, we're uh, as you know, I started super late because I had some uh, internet issues. So we're winding down here and we're talking deities. We're just having some fun now. So uh, uh, please uh, hang out, ask some questions. We're going to wind this up and uh, we're going to have the give three giveaways coming up very shortly. So, uh, well, that's good to know. Right, Anna? It's good to know. That yeah, stuff this that's is awesome. Like, you know, now I, now I know, discussion. now I know what to do with the uh, Altamira. I need to put some really crazy stuff in there. The yep. Taller mm-hmm. games, you know, I got yep. a broth. I have seven brothels in Altamira. Well, the problem is that they might go through nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, they're not brothels. They're fest halls. Fest halls. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Ah, uh, huh, yes, yeah. <laughs> now, now, you see, if you're going to put in seven brothels, what you should have is a, is a, a, a cut price war amongst them. Like like gas stations that are across from each other, and they keep undercutting each other. And then, of course, the ladies who work there, and the men who work there, and the monsters, and the doppelgangers who all work there are saying, <laughs> I'm going to starve. i got to go work for somebody else. Hey, adventurers, adventurers, would you like your own private, eye-catching, distracting, shape-shifting type lady escort? Because I just need to be paid in enough to eat because these guys aren't paying me. So you see, you put in little adventure hooks that go with your brothels, and then it's okay because there's an adventure reason for them being there. We had so uh, yeah, I'll just tell this real quick story. That so we we made up this one up in uh, Diamond Lake as we talk about Diamond Lake Anna. This is before it ever came out in Age of Worms. It was named a Tickling Feather. And that's just you know that was <laughs> yep. about as that was about as crazy as we got. So, um, but yeah, Sage of Ice, Josh says absolutely. Uh, so. Um, Anna, any any questions you want of the three? Uh, you know, I know we've really I'm, I, I'm, I, I I'm hopped up a lot. I'm with so cool stuff. So <laughs> yeah, this has been a great yes. discussion tonight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I just want to thank you all, all three of you, and and for hang, to come hanging on and, and 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 do this, even when we were late, and everybody who come up and chat and ask so many questions and and wonderful. So thank you. Well, one quick question that goes way back that um uh, I think Big Mac asked: Is it just convenience? All of the demi-human deities seem to cross over realms. Like uh, elves are all basically almost the same. What are you? What are your thoughts on that? You know, for the most part. Yes. So, so I guess what I would say is, um, I, I think there's some commonalities to them. Okay. It may suggest a common home world or not. Uh, depends on what you want to do with your planescape and spelljammer settings whether you view it as one big campaign world or separate campaign worlds. Um, but what I've tried to do in in my campaign is like each general cultural area, I talked about this for orcs, but like I could talk about it for elves as well, um, come up with different pantheons that are held together differently. So uh, George Krashos and I did uh, a DMs Guild release called Havens of Miertar, which was about sort of a surface realm of good aligned dark elves and green elves and they fled into an underground grotto to escape uh the horrific gold elves and so i had to come up with a pantheon that they worshipped and there were a bunch of really old dragon articles where chris perry had done some unique elven deities and so you can start making the pantheons different by grabbing some of those obscure deities pulling them together leaving out the old favorites and um you know, you can really build separate ones. So, yeah, I would say it's convenience, but if the DM really works at it, you can start building unique pantheons per uh, culture, per race, rather than just per race. Okay. And there's one tiny thing I, I'd like to interject here. You'll be amazed at how many design decisions way back in the early days were forced on people by word count, limits, or total lack of time like rescuing a product in a in a weekend so some of that stuff where the where the demi-human deities are duplicates or near duplicates it's because we have to we have no choice okay you know we, uh, we've got the press time we've got to get this product out the door the easiest fastest way to do it that's where you short it because you figure to yourself for good or for ill fewer gamers will play these at the time you know Fewer gamers will be playing these, so fewer people will squawk. Okay. Er, um, Eric M, your thoughts on that? I am currently buying this Havens of the Myeritar book that I just found out about. Wink! <laughs> <laughs> because I, one, after I get done with uh, Moonshase, 
I desperately want to write my uh, a, a book on uh, uh, Arendlin, the with the Haven in the Underdark, where we have a hidden cell of uh, my favorite deity, and Ed knows which one it is, Illustrae, who has yep. set up yes. a... I, I'm just a, I'm just admiring the poker face of the other Eric on this call as you said that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> yeah, no, we should talk, Eric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, please. because uh, I have art already, so yes, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, talk. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm typing this in. Uh, um, by, uh, I have a question for Troy, a really important one. By the way, all three of these gents are all have characters in the legendary adventure group in my game. Two drink minimum. So we're trying to set the next date for two drink minimum. Just note that that's uh, um, coming up. We'll, we'll get it. We'll get it set out. Uh, so the question that Troy Cannibal asks, because he's big on, uh, he's working on a lot of underwater lore. Uh, why no love for like the underwater aquatic deities? Is it just? It's oh, just... I have a lot of love for them. Okay. Um, like, uh, so I've been thinking about them a lot in the realms, for instance. Um, and uh, you know, what is uh, particularly? I've been thinking about it in the context of the North and the Kraken Society. You have Slarkethral, who's the the great Kraken. He's the chosen of Umberly. Um, you know. And he, he alone probably starts approaching that hero deity level if you use Greyhawk parlance. But, you know, you've got Umberly. She's sort of the classic, um, you know, sort of like, uh, I always think of the, the, uh, the queen from uh, The Little Mermaid. But uh, probably sure. ruins the deity. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. Uh, <laughs> Ursula or whatever her name was. Yeah. Uh, I watched that one too many times when my kids were little. But, you know, there's all sorts of other cool undersea deities. There's Panzerial from Carl Sargent's uh, monster mythology. Uh, there's Dagon, obviously, from the Cthulhu mythos. But James Jacobs did a great job in one of the 300s of Dragon writing the Prince of the Darkened Depths up. Um, you know, there is the uh, Sakola, the Sahuagin deity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you get even into some of the weirder deities uh, like... You know, who do the Morkoth worship? Who do the, um, oh, I, I'm blanking on their name. It starts with a K. They were in one of the monster manuals in third edition, kind of mm -hmm. eel-like creatures. Um, you know, from the Sea Devils, they introduced the Anguilons, um, who were the really, really deep Sahu again, and I think they had their own deity as well. So there's a ton of deep undersea deities that you can really start to put stuff together. You know, for the realms, I've started sketching out what does that map of the bottom of the trackless sea look like? What are the settlements? Oh. What gods do they worship? Um, and um, I at least saw one uh, note on the Cannon Fire Discord where they were talking about a future post fest of Under the Sea. So I was really hoping that they, after the Underdark one comes out, yeah, that they yes, would when it comes out. <laughs> Yes, that that would be the next one. I, I know that um, there's a lot of work going on right now, a lot behind the scenes on that. That would be really awesome, but definitely. Um, so, Eric, you'd be participating in that. That's great. Yeah. That is fantastic. So, hopefully, Troy, that answers your question there. That uh, there is work going on, uh, and that uh, Eric, Eric would be a go-to for that. Um, uh, uh, because uh, Dead Aussie Gamer rated, and I want to ask a specific question to Ed that he asked. Ed, if it's okay, do you sure. do you do you play Fifth Edition at all, and do you enjoy it? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Um, I go. I currently play Fifth Edition with the the group I most often can get to assemble now, and uh, I had to play every single edition umpteen times in play tests. You know, <clears throat> play it again with this falling damage. Play it again with this rule. You know, so I've done play tests for all the editions. the The edition I think in without without having to think about it, is second, because I did most of my design in that. You know, I learned how to think in second edition. Um, but I I play all of them. I don't like fourth edition as d and I think it's, to me, it's more like a combat game. Um, but I, I do use fifth edition right now, um, because that's what most of the younger gamers, that's what they know most, both. And... Uh, but on the other hand, the other way of talking about this is I really don't care about additions. It's role playing. Yep. So I'm basically we're telling a story together and I will say things like, uh, roll me a D20. What do I need? Never mind. Just roll the D20. <laughs> um, 
what am I trying to do? I don't know. What are you trying to do? What is your character trying to do? Oh, well, my character is trying to do this. Good. That's all I needed to know. You know, and, and then we tell the story. I really don't care what edition it is because I'm not in the, uh, the company is in the business of selling you new editions and rule books. I'm not. I'm in the business of having a good fun game with you in the scant time that we all have in our lives to game. Yes. And uh, mine's an old school game you all play in. There you go. Yeah. You know, with custom yeah. rules. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I love it. It's great. That's I think to myself, I think this should have been an, an official edition doing it this way. Oh, and with, yeah, with the, the points, with the points that the audience, the audience participation, that is like, wow. Just, Why didn't we do this for years at Gen Con? Not, this would have been crazy popular. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we, we had a game last night with a new group and I had a bunch of new people on and uh, literally uh, I could not stop the audience from feeding them hero points last night and I kind of saved their bacon. <laughs> yeah, it, it was good. It, definitely. Yeah, thank you, Blowwell. Thank you so very much. So um, I know we're really, we're almost to 11. We're, we've been, we've actually been on two <coughs> hours, which is long. We've actually been on yeah. longer than a normal show and we started so late and this has been really mm -hmm. wonderful. So uh, Anna and I... We'll not do shout outs tonight. No, to we cut skip that it down. for tonight. We'll skip hours. So Just yep. know that I have five streams this upcoming week Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be divorced after that. I guarantee it, but that's okay. Another, <laughs> <laughs> another but, All right, uh, you can sleep on my couch. <laughs> I'll have to come to Canada, Ed. I've been to Canada yeah. twice in my life. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, um, why don't we uh, let, uh, let our three guests uh, shout out what's going on and then we'll do the giveaways and then we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll uh, move on and find. I think we're going to read bones tonight. Yeah, because I did. I've did during the last two weeks. So, uh, Eric B, what's up, man? What's going on? You're, you're muted. Probably should have put this on earlier. Um, it's okay. George George Crashos and I just recently released something else on DM Guild, and it's actually related to deities. Um, it's about the saints of Ilmater. Um, the oh. uh, god of suffering. Um, and so we focused on the saints in the bloodland, or the, sorry, the bloodstone lands and Impulter. Um, so we have like, uh, I think it's a, uh, maybe eight or 10 saints total. Um, we picked up some really obscure ones. Um, my favorite, the one I, George wrote most of it, just to be clear, but the one I, I did a decent amount on was, uh, if you remember the old Bloodstone land modules, weirdly in the mines of Bloodstone, so in the Underdark, um, you meet the lady in the lake and she hands you the sword, the Crusader sword that's like the Holy Avenger you used to go on and slay Orcus with. And I always wondered who the heck that was. So, for instance, we detailed Saint uh, Lalabella, um, who is um, the uh, sort of this wandering, crying lady in the lake who keeps giving the sword out to one champion after another. So anyhow, we wrote up the the, the Saints of Ilmater. So if you look under my name or George's name, you can find that on DM Skill. Watery tarts. How easy is that, <laughs> do you think, to put some of that into Greyhawk? Oh, I think it would be really easy. Um, and Saints is not a fit. Yeah, I mean, there's been a little bit of Saints. Um, I'm trying to remember the article uh, in Dragon for Saints in... in um, uh, uh, Greyhawk. I may be confusing it some also with the uh, yeah. That's the Scott various... Benny. Scott Benny skate, and he just passed a few yeah. weeks ago, unfortunately. Yep. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I kind of in my mind linked that with some of the Death Knights. Sort of seemed to rise to the evil saint level as well. Uh, it... I know Gary Holy has done a bunch on them. Um, so, but yes, I think you could easily adapt these saints uh, into Greyhawk, and um, you might not want to have them all be saints of the same god. You might depending on their portfolios, drop them in with different Greyhawk deals. Is it Blessed of the Broken God? Saints yes. of Dem Okay, I'm going to link that in, in chat here. Yep. It looks good. Wow. It was fun to write. Here it is. Lots of realms lore. That may sound like a corner case, uh, you know, Saints of One God, but hopefully it gives people lots of realms lore and history yeah. and ideas for running different characters. In fact, we just, we just did... Uh, did um, demigod saints and quasi deities on uh, um, um, a previous uh, a previous uh, mm -hmm. legends and lore too so yeah and uh, scott came up and what is she i mean he, he did a lot of date of things that a lot of people didn't even know he did 
which was, mm-hmm. you know, which well, was, I mean, yeah. the night, nice, the nice thing about, I mean, Scott's done great things. Um, I also worked on a lot of his stuff that he'd done in FR 10 old empires, um, for the realms. But, um, what I was going to say about saints in particular is if you don't want to make your pantheon too big, but you want more variety for your clerics, um, you can use saints as a way to give different sort of flavors of the same deity. Um, and some of them can stray quite a bit from the main deity. So it's a way to kind of create the effect of multiple gods without making your campaign too confusing in terms of just having hundreds of gods. It's a great idea. Yep, St. Carga and St. Benador, and St. Benador is another one that Gary Holian made up in Greyhawk, and I used St. Benador and created especially priest specifically for it. So, yeah, another great mm-hmm. one. So thank you, uh, Dale, for that. And Eric, thanks for thanks for hanging in there. Yeah. Thank you. This really has been pre- a great time. Yeah, this has been a great show. See, this is what happens. Some Something crappy happens, but then we have a fantastic show, which is always uh, the the wonders of uh, the wonders of D&D. Always having a good time. Eric M. What's going on, man? Still trying to extract myself from the moonshades. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there were uh, 20 trilogies with a lot of adventures. And uh, we're now in the home stretch. I got the last... Got the last one's off to the proofreader, so now it's just prepping for republication. So I'm excited about that. In the near future, working, uh, doing some freelancing with uh, Rich Glescafer on his Esper Genesis Kickstarter that he launched. So I'll be doing some um, Space Fay, and that's about all I can say about it at the moment. And then this fall, I uh, hopefully this will come through because we've had delayed at least once because of all the COVID problems. A, we're going to be doing a D&D RPG travel is sponsoring a tour through Ireland. And for some reason, they seem to think I know a lot about fairies and druidic mm-hmm. style adventures. So I'm their lead writer for that one. After a few drinks, you will. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we're going to try to do our best to weave this adventure into the actual sites that the, you will be visiting during the day while you're touring about. So mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure the Book of Kells is going to figure into this somehow. Nice. Cool. Fantastic. Uh, so um, uh, do you have more stuff you're doing with Jose as well? I, I, uh, oh, yes. Okay. That's Gen- for Gen Con? Uh, I don't actually know when that is for. Okay. It's- Kind of loosey-goosey. So we did a whole bunch of fairy adventures for Living Greyhawk back in the day. And with all the attention paid to the Fae, they were really well done. And Jose was instrumental in getting those together. We were going to file all the serial numbers off and put them out uh, as general, uh, not specifically tied to a campaign adventures for people who want to do a really cool Fae-themed adventure that was drawn from the same inspiration as like the Chronicles of Prydain and the Mabinagian and a lot of the uh, more oh. old school Celtic stories. Nice. nice. Awesome. Nice. Well, it, much appreciated. I know, uh, you know, you do um, hang out a little bit there uh, and thank you so very much, Eric, for coming, for coming on late and uh, hang Thanks out. Thanks for having me. Oh, this was, it was wonderful. Everyone came, oh, everyone, with these guys. everyone brought their A-game with these stories. This was just mm-hmm. wonderful tonight. I mean, I just, yep. lovely. That's why I was so upset when they, I was like, oh my God, we can't do that. I was just I'm so looking forward to this. Um, but uh, for, favor of fortunes, the lucky, I guess, sometimes here. Uh, <laughs> Ed, what's going on? Oh, gee. Uh, <laughs> most of the stuff I can't talk about. Okay. There's a new Volo's Guide that I'm co-writing that's coming out this summer. Sure. Okay. Um, and it's to one city in the realms that's only ever received a couple paragraphs before. Okay. And um, let's see. What else is there? Uh, you all know about the Thay book. Yep. Land of the Red Wizards, um, the, which is going great guns. Um, Fantastic. And uh, let's see. I am... I just I just finished a novella today and sent it in and, and it's done and in for um, Lou Anders um, um, Norse setting uh, Thrones of Norongard, um, which is a cool if you just want to play Vikings Five E in its own setting. It's really nice. Um, and let's see. Uh, I'm working with Archvillain Games out of Greece. Um, look them up on the internet. They do gorgeous gorgeous minis and they do modules to go with them cool well now 
that's all going to become a world. And nice. worlds are what I do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. <laughs> that's fantastic. It's always good to, you know, get, get your expertise in there on that. Like, like the fate of the Norns, right? A lot of that too. Yeah. Oh yeah. And fate of the Norns, I am still about 16 city blocks away from finishing <sighs> The 96 city block city, and then I have to do the head deep dive ones, and then I have to go through them all again and tell you all how good a craftsman everybody is if they make things for you. And then I have to go through them all again and edit. And, oh, yes, and that's another thing. Um, there, are, I wrote a novel for that, and so did Michelle Franklin, and so did Stephen Per, um, and they're all coming, they're all going to come out as part of the Ultimate Viking anthology. So we have just been nice racing through the novels in an afternoon to do a, an overview read after the edits. You know how you, you clean up after the editor and fix and make sure they're in because Andrew is out in Calgary at a convention right now, trying desperately as every small gamer does <laughs> to earn a living by selling stuff. So we're frantically doing all the products, but little elves are, it, it's like Santa's away and the little elves are running around the workshop, cleaning up all their messes. Yeah, that's us. <laughs> wouldn't be it wouldn't be the gaming industry and world without that right because that seems to be that's what's been that way since the beginning and that's yeah that's what we do part of the evil charm of it all so uh well ed thank you for hanging in there and uh um you know and, and all of yours understanding on my uh, technical issues tonight but we got it we got this done this was a fantastic show we'll have another one with another topic down the road you know as well we'll get the two drink minimum game set you know, mm-hmm. uh you know uh, we'll continue with this wonderful group. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to do the giveaways real quick, and then we're going to do a raid, and we'll call an evening. Sound good? Right. Yeah. All righty. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Let me uh, set these up. Last calls, if you want to get in on that. Please, all I ask is your uh, you know, continental uh, North America for the hardback copy of, uh, and this is Troller Games, uh, one of our great sponsors, um, um, a book that we're going to... Um, we're going to give out here. It's been scrolling through too in the gods and legends. All right. And oh no, one thing I didn't even say, you know, I'm, uh, Anne and I have a project with Stephen Chenault and Stephen was kind enough to cross reference every single Greyhawk deity and specialty priest I have with an air deity. Cause a lot of them, he, he just said he rewrote them. So I have a list, their master list now, which is awesome, which is really, really cool. That'll, that'll help out. Thank, thanks Troy for that. So here we go. We're going to close this out. All right. Here we go, here we go, here we go. The winner of the hardback book. GD, there you go, man. Grats. GDTRFB 1995. Yes, grats, man. I, I, that's, a, that's a big win for you there. I just want to, I, I think you're on. I think it's, yep, you're on. Good. You got it. So uh, I think I have your name and address. Just make sure I do. Okay, please. Um, and then the uh, next winner, uh, these are these are two uh, digital copies. Mind you, Chuck still owes me two other digital th- codes, and it, he hasn't got me any of these codes yet. But mind you, so, I have, uh, as soon as I have the codes, I will get them to you. You know me. I get out stuff immediately once I have the codes. Wiley the Rats. Nice, grats. Wiley the Rats. Uh, just checking to make sure you are still, uh, that you are on. Grats for that win. And then the last digital code um, is... Uh, Josh Pop. <laughs> it's rigged. It's rigged, Zarathon. Rigged. Everyone can say that. So, wow. All righty. GD, Wiley, the Rats, and Zarathon. Nice. Grats winners. Uh, hang in there, please. Let's give uh, Bones, who played in the game last night. Bones and Darling were hysterical in that game last night. Uh, so you'd lo- you'll like this, uh, Ed. Uh, the, the, we had a gnome, illusionist thief. Named Phil Mafani. <laughs> well, it, well, you're down there. And it, uh, it was a, a female <laughs> player, and she, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I have to, I have to worry at that point. Hey, whatever. Uh, uh, you want me to reroll? Uh, you want? All right. Uh, uh, do you really want you, Troy? Do you, uh, Josh won't mind, right? Do you really want me to reroll? You know what? What this is what I'll do. I'll, I'll if, if Josh uh, complains, I'll do a I'll do a uh, I'll, I'll Dorgram. I'll uh, Dorgram's good. I'll burn. Uh, I'll make Chuck feel guilty and get me a third one. There you go, <laughs> Dorgram. You got it. All right. That's the no. That's the power I have over Troller Games. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
We're good. You got it, Dorgum. So, thank you, Eric M., Eric B., and Ed, and Anna. And we'll see you all Wednesday yeah, night you. for Liches of Greyhawk. <coughs> so, uh -oh. My. please note, yeah. I had to educate a bunch of people last night, including Dead Aussie Gamer, that Vecna was from Greyhawk. That Aserac yes. is from Greyhawk. Yes. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> We're going to have a These nice These youngsters. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Phoenixy. <laughs> yeah. So, it's uh, nice. At least we all know that Morden Kanan's from the realm. Right? <laughs> 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 ah, that's awesome. And Drow. <laughs> yes, and Drow. And oh my gosh. Oh, I, I once uh, wrote uh, a, a, a suppressed, <laughs> suppressed skit, which is Elminster doing therapy. With Morden Kanan when Morden Kanan's off his nut, and that was <laughs> censored out of existence in oh, a heck a of a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you ever do one of those in the Wizards Three? Like, oh, uh, you're having tough times or whatever, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, that's what I thought. So. Yeah, and oh it was like, a, oh no, we're not running this. And and Morden Kanan starts saying really weird stuff. Like his <laughs> his mind is obviously gone, and he's going, "Oh, ale, beer, and light wines," you know, which I'm cribbing from Connecticut Yankee, and so on, <laughs> and, and and deliberately. And they said, "We can't run this. You're supposed to be scared of him." And yeah. I said, "Hey, you show me a wizard who can like crack worlds, and he's completely off his nut and babbling. I'm scared." He yes. has no self-control. Exactly. Said, That's not the sort of scared we want. <laughs> we would we That's would love surreal. we He's would love just... to do a Wizards 3 discussion, but we need Rob Koontz, correct, Ed, for that? Uh let's see. Uh yeah, I suppose you do. Yeah. You need yep. somebody to represent the, the old guard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So any who would be a good replacement if we couldn't get Rob? <clears throat> hmm. Jim Ward. Yeah. Okay, so I could get so we get we get Hickman, right? You and, yeah. and Jim. Oh my yeah. gosh! Mm -hmm. Yeah, that will be a fantastic all right. All right, that, that's a ta that's a task. <laughs> that's a task because yeah. mm -hmm. I've already tried to get uh, I've already tried to get Will Wheaton and James Marsters Spike from Buffy in the two drink minimum game. I might as well shoot for the stars on this too. Mm -hmm. Wow, that would be awesome. All right, Ward, Ed, and I'll just Ed, I'll just throw your name out there. Ed's coming on, Jim. So. And, and Tracy, and we have Lord Bresson. Is, is Lord Bresson, <laughs> <laughs> and and it, and if Tracy Tracy can't try for Margaret, okay, okay, mm -hmm. oh yes, right. Jim could probably be talking to it. Well, I think I think with uh, with Ed and uh, and uh, and Hickman or Weissen, I think it would be fantastic. So I promise you all, I'm going to work on it. Okay. Sound good? See you all. See you all Wednesday night. Thank you for a wonderful show. Thank you for over 100 viewers. When we're two hours late coming on, this is insane. Thank you for the mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful support yes. from the community. It means a lot to us. And uh, yep. we'll see you all Wednesday night and have a good have, have a good Sunday night. Talk to you soon. Raiden in the Bones. Let me set this up. Wow. All what a great, great, great. What a great, great stream. And, uh, little bones. Do, 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 do. Give me one second here. As soon as the number clicks to the top, I'll hit the raid, and uh, we'll see you all soon, and uh, thank you. Look at that. Over 100 viewers going into the raid. Five, four, three, two, one. Have a good one. Wow, she's getting 100 people coming in. That's awesome. That is Excellent. awesome. And after all the... Man, I, you guys, I felt so freaking awful tonight. I, I mean, you, you just, I felt bad. I just... I couldn't.